<laughs> hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar and Music Licensing Profits. We got a great show today with Jeff Rona. You know what? I forgot to tell you, I had a guy on my show several years back. His name is Jeff Zona. Uh oh. Yeah, and I was like, imposters. Anyway, it's imposter. You're not related, right? No, no. Anyway, <laughs> you mean am I related to other people named Jeff? Hey, God, I hope not. Anyway, let me How tell you about Jeff Rona. He is a great guy, and he's super successful, and a lot of fun, and a brilliant guy. He's an award-winning composer for film, TV, and video games, as well as a recording artist and a producer. He was initially an in-demand studio musician, arranger, sound designer. He was a very early adopter of synthesizers. He's like the MacGyver of synth. Uh, and music programmer working in L.A. and in New York City. He's also recorded and performed as a member of John Hassel's Fourth World Group. And if you're not familiar with that, they were like a unique a, a unique band combining ethnic and, and electric sounds. And Jeff co-composed and produced their, their famous album, City Works of Fiction. Uh, after working with legendary record producers such as Maurice White, David Foster, Albie Galutin, Malcolm Cecil, and others. By the way, you ever try to put Albie Galutin in spell check? <laughs> Even spell check to know what the fuck was going on. Uh, he focused his efforts on film music, most notably collaborating with Philip Glass, Mark, is it Isham? Isham. Mark Isham, Lisa Gerard, and Basil Paladuris, and he's had long-standing relationships with composers Hans Zimmer and Cliff Martinez. Jeff scored dozens of films and television projects with filmmakers including Ridley Scott, Steven Spielberg, Wong Kar Wai, Robert Altman, Steven Soderbergh, Mark Pellington, Stephen Hopkins, Jonathan Demme, Frank Darabont, and many others. Movie soundtracks Jeff scored or contributed to. Check this out. Black Hawk Down, Mission Impossible 2, Generation Iron 1 and 2, Traffic, which is a great movie, The Lion King, another great movie, The Thin Red Line, another great movie, Prince of Egypt, The Net, Sandra Bullock, Sea of Life, that, what a killer documentary that was, Shelter Island, Toys at Robin Williams, The Fan, and literally dozens of other major motion pictures. He's written music for video games. He doesn't play around, man. And he's he's not doing. And I don't like, play games. No, you don't play. Oh, actually, I'm not, supposed, I'm not. I shouldn't say. Not that. supposed to say. He's not. Do, <laughs> he's not doing pong. He's doing God of War three, <laughs> far far pong, <laughs> Far Cry four, Marvel Marvel versus Capcom Capcom Infinite Transformers Resident Evil two Crossfire Devil May Cry five and Bright Memory Infinite. He also toured with check this out Brian Eno Lisa Gerard on her solo gig. From Dead Can and Dead Can Dance as well, and he composed mm -hmm. music for the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. His music appears in numerous Oscar, Peabody, BAFTA, and Emmy award-winning projects, as well as countless film festival <sighs> honors. He's a three-time recipient of the ASCAP Film and Television Music Award, and he's authored several successful books on music, which you can find on Amazon.com. Dude, I'm exhausted. What a background. I'm exhausted, too. What do you mean? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show, wow. man. I've been looking forward oh, to talking like with I, you. I, could, I should go to bed for a little bit now. <laughs> <laughs> Break out the martini. It's yeah. only 9 Mind you, that was spread out over quite a number of years. Oh, man. It, it, <laughs> what a career. It's 924. It's uh, early enough for martini in L.A. There you go. <laughs> is it? Is it? It is, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. I've been looking forward it to is, talking with you. It is a thrill to be here, and I mean that. You're, Thanks, man. You're, you're, you're formidable. What you've been doing uh, is Oh, incredible. come on. I'm not formidable. I'm not even formidable with my kids anymore. Well, nobody is. <laughs> I know. It's terrible. Talk to my kids. So, <laughs> you're talking to the who? <laughs> I know, man. Uh, all right. Let's start at the beginning, sort of. You went to college. <clears throat> to study photography but your roommate had a collection of movie soundtracks that ultimately led you to film composing and i know it wasn't such a, a it wasn't a linear line like that but i was curious jeff what was so compelling about the movie soundtracks and what did that like trigger in you that you had that's a good question so uh you know i grew up playing music i was a flute player uh you know uh, is what it is, and um, in, but I had this fascination with art and photography, and when I did go to college, it was to study uh, art, but, um, you know, the whole time I was still playing music, I was still studying, I was taking classes, but yeah, at one point I, um, I switched, 
uh, I switched apartments and had a new roommate who was a, a true fan of film soundtracks. And he played, he, I'd never l really listened to one and with any, with any awareness. So he played me a Jerry Goldsmith soundtrack that had orchestra and synthesizers and it was cool and it was weird and it was emotional and I'd never really been exposed to the idea of music being fresh, unusual, but still compelling in some kind of a, an emotional storytelling way. And it, it honestly just resonated with me. I'd been fascinated uh, by movies. I had written a little bit of music for a couple of student films just as an experiment. And it wasn't really, I, I didn't really have an aptitude for it. So it was, I'm grateful that I had that opportunity to uh, find somebody whose who's passion and enthusiasm uh, triggered, you know, something in me. To, and I think what it triggered was an interest to continue exploring it, you know. By the way, he went off and became uh, Danny Elfman's orchestrator and is to this day. Oh, that's wild. That's crazy, man. Let me, you said something in there that I... You said I didn't really have the aptitude for it, for writing music yet. Yeah. You're like an incredibly successful composer. So how did you... Well, I, I, look, I mean, there's... Everything takes some practice. I mean, every so often you meet a you meet a savant, you know, you meet a prodigy. Okay. Uh, but I am neither of those. So for me, the process was to first get a lot of bad music out of my system. Right to stop being rote about about making music and just thinking about well if i do these notes it should feel like this i don't think i was listening to my own music with a critical eye i think i was so caught up in the in the technical aspects of of making and recording something that it didn't occur to me that what i really needed to do was hit stop for a second, close my eyes, listen to the music and ask myself, is this making me feel something? Mm. And if so, what? And is it, does it uh, align with my intention? Because honestly, you know, you, you, there's no such thing as good music and bad music. But music, at least when it comes to writing music for collaborations like film tv games licensing whatever there is this notion of intent which is i am trying to evoke something from the audience from the listener what is it and am i achieving it and am i achieving it at at a high enough level that it's getting through that nothing's getting lost in translation and that's not easy that that takes a certain amount of nuance which I didn't really have a grasp of for a while. So I had to kind of do it, fail, do it again, fail. And then, I don't know, one day something kind of clicked like, hey, before you pass this back on to somebody, you know, give it, give it a little more thought. So that's kind of it. That's sort of the process to me. You made a comment in an interview I listened to and this is what it reminds me of when you you said something like the difference between good composers and bad composers is good composers are able to recognize when they write bad music 100% yes yeah. a good That's composer knows when they've written shit yeah. and they hit the delete button and you know look around the room that nobody is watching <laughs> and then you, and then you do it again and there's no you know there's no um that's not failure. There's no shame in in that. That's part of the process. You know, artists sketch dozens of sketches before they commit to an idea that might go into paint. And in fact, over, only in the last uh, few years have there been these uh, X-ray analyses of famous paintings in which they're finding all these layers, these hidden layers to famous paintings where they took out the a hand or they took out a, a an object or added things. And what they realize is that a lot of famous paintings have many, many false ideas that they that ended up being uh, edited out, if you will, from from the final. So, 
you know, if it's if it's good enough for Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, right. There's there's right. no shame in. Uh, my process is always loose and fast, sketching, more sketching, more sketching, until something kind of grabs, and then spend the time to explore that and see how much further you can take it. You know, don't don't rely on your first uh, inspiration unless that ends up being the one. Right, right. Are you a uh, you're are you a patient? You're a patient guy, I would imagine. Uh, it depends. No. Yeah. Depends. Why? Because th the thought you just put into that question and answering it, I, I was, I mean, I, you thought about that answer as you're going along, you know, I mean, it was just, you could, you're, you're, you were very intentional and deliberate about your answer, you know, you, uh, like, well, I, I mean, um, I don't know that thoughtfulness is the same thing as patience, hmm. you know, I, I've designed my studio around uh like no wasted energy right you know so which is you know the mother of invention if you will well laziness <laughs> is the mother of invention <laughs> what was that jerry goldsmith soundtrack by the way logan's run oh wow i remember that uh, a score from the uh, a super b movie from the 70s yeah i, that I that. discovered um and uh Although the movie was, I, I saw the movie. It's a trashy movie, um, but the score was orchestra and and modular synthesizers, and it was it was genuinely cool. Yeah. And when you watch the movie, it's like the only genuinely cool part of the movie. The rest of the movie was, it's you know, it's very difficult to write good music for a bad film. It, it's almost impossible. Yeah, I would imagine, and it, that's because. The feeling, your your emotional connection to to communicating something is is kind of hindered. Well, it's because you're there to complete somebody else's vision. You know, the the director, the producers, you're on their team, and if they're, you know, hell bent on creating something kind of junky, well. Not, not that that's anybody's goal, but it kind of just ends up happening sometimes. Sure. And you're kind of along for the ride in some ways. Yeah. Not Let's... to say you can't be inspired and do your absolute best. It's just that by the time you sit and watch it in the theater or watch it, um, it just doesn't have the same spark that something for a genuinely inspired project will have. Sure. In some ways, I can't explain it. In some ways, it's hard to understand myself. But um, music kind of rises to the level of 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 the overall project. Interesting. There's exceptions. Yeah. Early on in your career, I mentioned that you did sessions for movie scores, and then you got hired to do ghostwriting for TV and movies, and then yeah. well, you eventually got your. Uh, your own series to score, which we'll talk about next. But how did you first get movie sessions, like session work for for movies? You know, and what yeah. instrument was that on? Was that on synth or uh, keyboard? Synths or? and sampling. You know, I was. So you know, I'm I'm a man of a certain age, and when I came up, uh, electronic music was something that was still quite difficult to produce. Yeah. The tools, I mean. Computers were still fairly new to the game. You know, I came in just as um, as that was starting to be a thing. Sampling was finally coming down in price from the the days of the Synclavier and Fairlight, where a good system was, you know, would cost you six figures. Suddenly, there started to be samplers that were affordable, you know, in the low thousands. And I got involved very heavily. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that um, when I was in my mid twenties, um, I lied my way into a job working for Roland. Tell that story. And, I listened to it. It was great. And, um, well, I was a musician. I was accompanying dance classes for a living and teaching flute and mostly playing for dance dance teachers here in LA. And, um, one day I was at a, and I, I'd had a little bit of interesting experience with, um, 
a scientist from the Jet Propulsion Laboratories who I'd met by accident at a concert one night, and we got into a conversation. And he mentioned that he was training a computer to improvise music, and I was fascinated. I'd had been working with synthesizers, been working been working a little bit with digital instruments when I was in college. Uh, my college got one of the very first prototype digital synthesizers from uh, a group of professors from Dartmouth College who eventually started uh, New England Digital, which became the Synclavier some years later. But So I'd been exposed to some d software work and sound design and synthesis with computers. And one day I walked into the Guitar Center store here in Los Angeles, and there's a couple of guys from Roland putting up some new instruments. And I said, oh, I can make a computer connect to your instruments and play music. And it's like, no, you can't. That's impossible. You have to come over to Roland and show us. Mm -hmm. So the next day, I was actually in the office of the president of Roland U.S., and he offered me a job. And um, within a year, that job turned into being part of the development uh, team that brought MIDI into the world. So another kind of back alley of, of my life. But while I was at Roland, I was involved with sound design I was involved with their first sampler, their first MIDI interface, some other synthesizers, but the sampling thing got very heavy and um, did a lot of work in that. And then after four years, I was just burned out working for a company. Um, Roland had started off as a small, successful company, became a large, successful company while I was there, and I just wanted nothing to do with it. So I quit to become a sound designer. Uh, for studio musicians here in LA who were doing sessions. And eventually those musicians started recommending me to the composers on TV shows like Star Trek and uh, other, you know, shows of the time. And um, I ended up just becoming a sound designer for, first for the, the studio players, then um, record producers, uh, working with some of the record producers you mentioned. Um, did you mention Maurice White? First, yeah, I did, yeah. Okay. And, um, Is there and eventually a specific these, story you want to talk about with him? Uh, uh, we can come back to that. Okay. But because it's part of the path, um, what, what I found was that eventually, after working in the record world for a long time, all of my clients as a synthesis, sound designer, collaborator were film and TV composers. And some of them were older, uh, more experienced musicians or composers who were struggling to stay relevant as film and TV was starting to veer towards electronic music because, first of all, the economy of it is just radically different, not having to hire orchestras and ensembles and rhythm sections and guitar players. And, and it just became a predominant aspect of film and, and TV at the time. And so I became very useful to these people trying to hang on to their careers. But what they, I think because of the nature of, of um, writing for synthesis, writing for writing electronic music is, is a little bit different than writing for say piano or orchestra. With piano, with orchestra, you know what the instrument is first. It's, it's handed to you. You don't get to decide. You're not at, you don't need to decide what yeah. a piano sounds like, what a string quartet sounds like, what a, what a funk rhythm section sounds like, you know, what a string section sounds like. But with electronic, and, and so whenever you, so whatever instrument you write for, you write for that instrument and you write differently for piano than you'd write for a brass section, which would be different than writing for a harp or, a, or, or even an, uh, an electric piano. They each have a, a sound and you maximize the, the, the nature of that instrument in your writing. But in electronic music, all of that kind of goes out the window. Really, you're, you're, you first have to create your orchestra and then compose music that can only be realized on that, on that palette of sounds, that template of sounds. And that's actually kind of a heavy thing. It's a beautiful yeah. opportunity to write in a very non-conventional way. You know, you can't one thing I learned was you can't transpose something written for piano into a, a cool, interesting electronic sound. You really have to have that sound inspire you in real time with the feedback of playing it and saying, you know what? Yeah, but when it gets to the high range, it gets too abrasive. So I'm going to write lower. 
you know, really simple things like that. So um, that's when becoming a ghostwriter started to really happen because these composers that I worked for started to realize that having me come up with, you know, cool, you know, bleeps and gurgles wasn't going to really advance their career or maintain their career because they themselves were not capable of composing in a very sensitive way to the to the to the timbre and quality of, of sound. So that led to me becoming a, a a ghostwriter a lot for four or five years. I mean, I still do it occasionally, and um, and it's 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 an interesting path to go from appreciating the sound, but maybe not being particularly adept at being a writer, to starting to build one's writing abilities using your strengths and eventually trying to overcome some of your weaknesses. So that's, I never thought about that. That's really interesting what you said, because you don't know what something's going to sound like. You, you can't write to a string uh, orchestra you know, on a on a keyboard it's that's really interesting well you can if you understand it you know mm. and that requires some amount of study some amount of knowledge some amount of experience and um you know sure uh classical composers sit at a piano and write for orchestra but you know they really you understand what a viola sounds like in its you know upper range you understand what what a trombone sounds like if you write too low and if you write close harmonies you know too low and it gets muddy versus an open harmony that starts to sound quite bold and beautiful to some extent the piano helps and in some ways it it hinders if you don't have some conceptual awareness of how how orchestral instruments work so was that four or five years for you like uh sort of like tuition for the next level that was 100 yeah. percent school yeah. i yeah. failed in college i was a straight f student in music um and i wasn't ready it wasn't my, it wasn't my way forward but working with these other composers because you know as a ghostwriter um you're sort of sheltered a little bit because you know, sometimes you're allowed to be at the meetings, but you're a fly on the wall when, when a piece you've written gets played for the director. And if it goes well, you don't get the credit. But if it goes poorly, you don't get the blame. Right, right. At least until after the director leaves, then you basically yeah, then... get it squarely between the eyes. But because you've embarrassed them, even though they've listened to it, you know, many times before playing it for the directors. But um, no, I think ghostwriting isn't the only way into becoming a good writer but i think for me you know again not feeling that i had an aptitude for it or a, a natural mm. talent it was a great opportunity to um experiment be able to try things over and over again uh get better at it while sort of not on the clock because now i'm on the clock i've been on the clock for 25 30 years Right. So I don't get the opportunity to hide. You've used that word experiment a few times. Has that been one of the best things or the things you like the most about composing <clears throat> in this media for, for to a picture that it's allowed you to experiment beyond what you had known before? I think as a because so as a composer with a heavy focus on electronic music, although I've written tons of orchestral music. But I think my, my happy place and my comfortable place is, you know, synthesizers and, and, and signal processing and, well, by definition, more experimental music. And I don't care what anybody says. Electronic music is experimental. Hmm. You know, you really don't know what the outcome is going to be when you get started. You know, you patch something in on a modular synthesizer and you, you're usually going for something, some, you know harsh metallic bass thing and along the way something kind of unexpected and semi-miraculous might happen and you go you know what i'm gonna go with this right this is right. this is this is better right. um so yeah um i guess you know stravinsky used to say composition is frozen improvisation right <laughs> and and um i'm fascinated spending a lot of time with jazz musicians 
and you know you've spent your life surrounded by improvising you know musicians whether it's jazz or rock or pr prog or whatever um that that freedom is is a necessity and if your job is to compose well yeah you know eventually you, i mean not eventually at at first it's like well okay let me i'm gonna write something the scene is a happy scene or the movie is a happy movie i'm gonna write something happy i'm doing a netflix christmas movie right now which is so out of character but it's my second one so um why is it out of character just because it's not uh because because you know i rarely write in major key oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> but but you know so so you have a project well i'm also doing a, a big video game so okay. this video game ultra super dark you know you're fighting some super evil uh monstrosities and um you know you go in with a with an idea of the mood you're trying to create so it, whether it's threat or violence or or um angst or you know i mean there's a spectrum of dark and there's a spectrum of light so actually i'm doing these two projects at the same time I'm doing yeah. this super dark video game and i'm doing this kind of fun happy um uh holiday movie so um with, with each one uh i think you start with an intent like we were saying before and then you go okay so i'm gonna write something happy you know what what key are we in today g major i love g major it's you know it's happy it sits under my thing oh d major okay sure you know i play these these irish flutes over here and they sound great in d so let's go for that and um and from there, it's like, well, what's the next step? And the next step is just live in that world. Just sit with no expectations that anything is is going to stay. But just live in that world. And then eventually, maybe like two chords back and forth start to feel, oh, wait a minute, maybe there's something here. And oh, this melody kind of in octaves, sort of triplet, oh, a triplet feel. Maybe, oh, you know, triplets feel good. Um, and and they're happy, so <laughs> so I guess it's just this sort of drilling down into something that starts as there is no music, and then eventually it's like, well, th these are possibilities. Right. But eventually, you have to narrow down your possibilities to one final idea and present that as here's theme one. So everything's an experiment for me in a sense yeah that's i mean pretty, you yeah. know I, i've seen other composers kind of just sort of you know look up at to uh, look up to the sky for 15 seconds and then play a tune you know actually because when i was young i used to work for basil polydorus who is if nobody's heard of basil polydorus look him up uh robocop starship troopers hunt for red october uh fucking brilliant pianist fucking brilliant composer um and for some reason he just had this ability that music just came out of him and his first thing was like it he just he was he just came from another planet i i I, w I did a little bit of electronics for him and i also assisted his orchestrator to do additional orchestration uh my first thing i was still in college was working on the second conan movie with that's a, that's awesome that's uh, a good opportunity Conan the destroyer and so uh i learned a lot from him and he he was the king of intent but he didn't he didn't have that that experimental thing he just at least not in front of me because yeah. uh, he would just say what if we did something like like i can remember uh him sending in a cue and it got rejected the, the producer said this isn't what we're looking for I need something from you, but I need it within an hour or so, so we can get it, you know, ready. And in, you know, he just sort of sat down and goes, how about this? And boom. Uh, frankly, it was the better cue. Right. Even though he'd spent days on the first one and minutes on the second one. Yeah. There's no correlation, really, between uh, that kind of intent and time. Especially if you're, you know, somebody quite brilliant and who has a, a musical brain that just there's music inside of there i don't really have it's not that internal for me i need to work it out 
I think what, this is a, a really important lesson, actually, for people doing anything, because everything, in, you know, a lot of times you, you're in a, in a business setting, in any setting, you, you know, people have this thing about, man, I need to get this done. It needs to be right. And that never happens. Everything evolves. You know, this show of everything evolves. You know, this it's very rare. The first, you know, if you're trying to make something happen, that three months or three years into it, you're going to have the same. It's never happened to me anyway. You know, yeah. In a business setting, and I think that's yeah. in general. Well, you know, you know hey, it takes all kinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so you, at a certain point in time. You then got your first solo composing project, which was scoring the groundbreaking TV series Homicide, Life on the Street for Barry Levinson. How did that mm -hmm. come about and how did you feel? Was that like you like must have been jacked up when, when you had that opportunity? Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, so a couple of years prior, after having worked with a bunch of other uh, L.A. based uh, film and TV composers, a friend of mine called me up. He said, hey, Jeff, I just sold a sampler to this composer who just moved to L.A. a couple months ago, and I told him about you, and he'd love to meet you. His name is Hans Zimmer. And <laughs> Hans was, was fresh off the boat. He had done one film that had garnered some interest, and it was uh, a film with Barry Levinson. Um, well, he'd done Driving... Um, he'd done um, uh, Rain Man. Okay. And uh, Rain Man kind of put him on the map. Mm. Before that, he had done a couple of small films. And he, he himself was a ghostwriter in, uh, in England. So he was in L.A. We met. We hit it off uh, in, 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 in a big way. And we ended up working off and on for the next decade. And we shared a studio for about uh, seven, eight years. We had a, uh, we had a, uh, a building with a few other composers, uh, some of them very notable. And... Um, so Hans had worked on a movie and I'd helped out on a movie called Toys with uh, that Barry Levinson had directed with Robin Williams and LL Cool J and um, Michael Gambon. And I did some really weird, quirky, out there uh, pieces for a very quirky, out there movie. And um, Barry really liked it. And Barry was doing his very first foray into television as a producer director. And he had this idea of a show that would look like a documentary and it had never been done on network TV. Um, and it was this uh, television series called Homicide Life on the Street, based on a book about a, that a cop had written about a year on the streets in Baltimore, where Barry Levinson is from and where all, most of his movies are set, you know, diner and what have you. And, um, you know, he remembered some of the things I had done and he reached out to Hans and said, hey, you know, what about getting Jeff on this? television show and Hans said why not you know absolutely because they wanted a score that was anti-musical that did not feel like conventional music it that felt like it was more almost like sound design coming out of the background but was evocative emotionally and so he brought the pilot over and Hans and I watched it and Hans had a couple of ideas and I had some ideas and we wrote up excuse me a couple of scenes and um and then it, it, it flew. It, it went very well. And I did uh, two seasons of that show. Then the show moved to New York and somebody else took it over. But those two seasons were, were phenomenal. You know, that's the show that launched movie, you know, shows like The Wire yeah. and Treme. In fact, the people who created those sort of more gritty, uh, reality-based, kind of reality-feeling shows, they all started working because they worked on Homicide. So Homicide was really a tipping point or, or, a, or a shift from kind of more conventional entertainment with conventional music and conventional filmmaking techniques into this gritty run and gun style um, visual. A lot of it was first network show shot handheld. Um, Interesting. And, and I was given incredible latitude to do crazy weird things. And um, and that was phenomenal to have that opportunity. So uh, over time, though, emotion became more and more important in the show as as the depth of these characters started to develop. And um, 
And so I did start to integrate more conventional things. And a lot of it was based on guitar. About half that score was based on on the use of, of guitar, either as a sound design tool, like a more ambient, weird mm-hmm. thing, a rhythm instrument, and then a melodic instrument. And it was all because of my, my guitar player, uh, the late Greg Aragine, who I had met playing with John Hassel and who was part of Brian Eno's Brain Trust and used to tour with Seal and Katie Lang and, and um, Chris Isaac. But at, he was, at his heart, an avant-gardist and had built these guitars that were capable of very unusual uh, tunings. Because um, he, he built a, a one-octave whammy bar, but it was sort of calibrated. one-octave? Yeah, he built it himself. And, and, and you know, uh, not using the Floyd Rose thing, but having it that you could go from one chord to a different chord by bending, that, it, that the strings bent at different rates, as opposed to the kind of what we all do now with, well, I'm not a guitar player, but what guitarists do, that a chord holds and it simply bends. He mm-hmm. could actually vary the um, tonality of a chord by bending it, and it could go from major to minor and pentatonic to diatonic and things like that. So we had a lengthy relationship um, until he passed away. Um, his very last recording session was with me. Oh. And um, and uh, he he became kind of the soul of quite a lot of that score, where I would give him quite a lot of latitude to create things. And, and Barry Levinson and the team loved what he did, and and it did have a very blues uh, oriented feeling. Barry Levinson is a blues aficionado himself, and definitely loved hearing that. It just represented some a type of American music that wasn't very typical uh, for television. You know, wasn't as clean, clean cut. You know, wasn't as as. Um, it just has a there's just a a, a gritty, more inner city uh, vibe and and the show, which was I think still very way ahead of its time, in how it depicted race and how it depicted. Uh, crime and and it did not follow any of the the tropes of the day um, and a lot of shows took that and and figured out that um, that there were other ways to to depict how you know crimes happen and um, so yeah so I think a combination of crazy sound design and and experimental music and 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 a touch of this convention of the of not conventional but this you know well trod style of music blended into something that was quite unique i don't think they ever released a soundtrack of it it's too bad when i heard you in an interview and, and you had you knew barry was interested in blues music and i was curious and so when when you thought it would be a well i didn't i didn't know that but i would go to his house uh, every week to watch the show and talk about each episode, what's called spotting, where you decide where the music will be and won't be. And he liked to sit and kind of watch the movie and watch the episode with me. And we'd say, you know what? This scene is very gritty, but don't put any music here. Instead, let's put music there when it turns out that, you know, they were lying. And, you know, sometimes Barry would have to run off and take a phone call, and he had a pretty substantial record collection in his in his office in, at his house here in L.A., and I noticed that at least half of his uh, music collection was blues. And so, you know, one day I said, because he said, you know, there's something missing that we've really got to tap into. What do you think that could be? And I said, I don't know. What about blues? And he just... He lit up. He had no, and he didn't realize that I, I'd said that after having sort of scanned his his uh, record shelf. And um, but you know why not? He should have just sit, come out and said it, but he didn't. Right. And and so instead, it was sort of left to me to figure out what might or might not work. And I think I think it worked out well. When you when I heard that story, I was curious. How much time, or does it usually benefit you to spend time getting to know whoever's the decision, the ultimate decision maker, to you know, to get their personal vibe and maybe their yeah. musical vibe? Is that something that's time well spent? Man, it is 
so critical. Okay. Anytime, anytime in my career that a project has not gone well, had had run in, has run into roadblocks or issues, has been when the communication wasn't uh, optimal. Ultimately, as a con as a collaborator, you have to be able to step into somebody else's head. And the only way to do that is through language, through talking. You know, you, you can get together with somebody and say, so what are your favorite movies? What are your favorite albums? Yeah. You know, what are your favorite uh, episodic TV shows? And, and they say, oh, well, you know, I just love science fiction or, you know, I just loved Dune or I love, you know. Yeah. Well, that's that's a big step forward. But ultimately, you have a problem. Musicians have an issue with language in that describing music with English is very difficult. Talking about art is difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you describe what a piece of music feels like? Ultimately, you can't. So I really feel that part of the secret sauce of having an excellent relationship is basing it on a, on a combination of trust and and communication. So every every successful project should always start with a serious conversation. And the best way to do that is to not talk about the project. Right. But to talk about, you know, you know, what were your, you know, what was it like growing up and what was, you know, what was your first movie and, you know, what, uh, what inspires you and who inspires you and, right. you know, what, what's your, what are you, you know, do you believe in God or, you know, it's, it's to understand the soul of somebody because eventually you're going to get into some very technical things of, of editing and pace and tempo and key and modulation and dynamics and recording and, and, and taste. But if you don't know who you're writing for or actually with, right? I don't see how you can do it. And you are writing with the people that you are working for. I, I think a lot of that is depend on you as the, your mindset and how you approach something. You like uh, like one of the things that I you came across as very service oriented. Like you're fully aware of, hey, this isn't about me writing music. This is about me. And I think I may even have a question. You have two customers. I got the end user, the cons whoever's going to watch the thing wherever it shows, whether it's a video game, television show, movie, and then you have the people responsible. And so, like, you have been able to, to, to me, realistically say, hey, I know this, so I got to get the temperature of these two and marry this all together yeah. to make a successful, happy, you know, yeah. score. It's a Did good you point. know this? I, I, I think I'm you're sorry. 100%. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Uh, one of the questions I ask anybody I work with is who's going to watch this? Who's, who's your audience? Who are you? Who did you write for? Who are you directing for? Dude, and that is so that's, clever. That's, it's, and it's a fascinating question because it's not always obvious, you know? You know, something might be a comedy, but it's not necessarily for kids, you know? Or, or there could be a sly subtext. There usually is, you know? Um, a good director likes to be a little subversive and, yeah. and likes to sneak some messages into into a story. Sometimes through you know little character backstories and little tiny little things, but you know, adding a little grit or a little spice or a little sweetness to something in, in unexpected ways is is valuable. I, I think the way I've always tried to look at my work with, with directors and producers is my job is to fulfill their vision, but do it with some surprises. At what point in time in your career did, did you sort of get hip to, Hey man, I need to have these, I need to, we need to have this talk or is, is that your nature? Like, are you, do you naturally go in and just chat? You know, um, 
again, learning through mistakes. Um, it wasn't something I started off thinking about. But, you know, look, spending you spend a decade with Hans Zimmer, and he is really so... Um, he's so focused on his collaborators so closely, and he forms very close relationships and incredibly intimate conversations. And I, you know, I got to sit in on countless uh, dinners and, and lunches and, and late night, you know, uh, drinks with Hans and and these great producers and directors. And I got to really understand, since I was working on some of these projects or most of these projects, um, what was actually happening. Because you, th it looks like they're just having dinner. It looks like they're drinking a bottle of wine, but they're not. They're getting closer to a solution, to a problem. Right. That's, that's what you're. And, and you to carry, and you can carry that into just about anything. I feel, you know, everything we do, we do for the experience, and how we create experiences is through our connections to other people. So. The, these things in my studio are my tools, but they're not my music, you know, and and my music exists because, well, I mean, I do my own music as well. I do my solo projects, although that's something I only started doing very recently. Um, but my soundtracks are the results of conversations and relationships with filmmakers and documentary uh, makers and video game developers and and television producers. And so each one I, I've built, you know, I, I build enough rapport so that they they don't listen to a piece of music and, and look at me and go, what the fuck were you? What, what the fuck was that? <laughs> What's going through your brain when you? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. is that for somebody else or is that for me? Because right. that doesn't sound like something I would want. <laughs> right. and, and if that happens, that means you you they were, yeah you man weren't paying attention. Right, right. <laughs> well, uh, those two things that you said that I think I just want to highlight because I think they're super important. The first is you mentioned this a couple of times solving a problem, and the bottom line is I don't care what you're doing for a living. That's why you're getting paid. There is a problem that presents itself, and your job is that you provide the solution. So I think that is a very smart, healthy attitude. And the other thing I think is smart, that you call these people collaborators, because some people would go in this, oh, I got a meeting with my boss. Mm -hmm. That's going to bring a freaking really different result than, oh, I'm collaborating with this person. I want to find out how they'd like to see things go and where, you know, what's this about and how do we get mm -hmm. there together? And, you know, totally, you're going to get, you know, different input, different output, you know, on both of those things, dramatically different. And I think that's extremely clever on your part doing that. You know, some of the, some of the most difficult um, projects I've worked on were ones where, at some point, some producer who was not a creative partner kind of took the reins and said, I'm writing the checks. I'm going to tell you what is and isn't going to be in my movie. Right. And bypassing the creative people. And um, those have tended to be the some of the worst projects I've worked on have just been when somebody considered themselves to be the boss it's like I, i've like look I, i've had at least one producer i've had a few producers just basically say i write the checks you you will do what i say and that <laughs> that that does not end well do you want to out them right now no <laughs> I had to ask. Not that I want I, to work for them again. I don't. Oh, no, but, I know. Uh, I know. I I totally get it. Yeah, but that's know, yeah. It's a small it's, town. We don't we don't kiss and tell. No, I know. I know. Um, but thank you for asking. <laughs> no, in fact, that's one of the few edits because sometimes people will forget that we're recording and they'll say, you know, I work for that guy and that bastard never paid me. And so I always make <laughs> a note. I always make a note in red, and at the end, I'm like, hey, listen, you know, if you want to end your career, is, is your thing, but I prefer you don't do it on this show. I'm going to edit okay. that out, you know. So yeah. Well, when I, I do want to end my career, and at some point I should, I'll call you. <laughs> Put me on. Put me in, coach. Put me in. <laughs> I'll name names. Yeah. Um, for people that aren't 
as comfortable having the con- you know, <clears throat> most creatives I find are very comfortable opening up. That's one of the reasons mm-hmm. I love doing this show so much because it's a you know creative people are a lot more willing to make themselves vulnerable than like you know the CEO of a company. Not that you can't be both. But, you know, when you're strictly business and not creative, it's not the same. And I've lived in both worlds now. Sure. Um, But there are people that are uncomfortable having conversations. Any Mm -hmm. advice or things that, you know, to get them started or like a mindset they need to have or they might try to adopt to make their lives easier? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, you know, when um, if you've ever been to a therapist, (laughs) um you, they don't ask you about your mother on the first visit, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> they don't start the opera on the high note. They they kind of <laughs> they kind of build up to it a little bit. And uh, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh, did I get you on that if, one? If I didn't turn around, it would have been all over the camera. <laughs> god! You know, one of the composers. <laughs> I, just a quick a quick aside where that, yeah, that yeah. expression came from. I'll never forget. I so I was a sound designer. I was a synthesizer programmer for this. Uh, one composer who did a lot of sitcoms and and I worked for him for a couple of years off and on and he was a cool guy we became very close and um, he had been married for a while he was older than me and I had just gotten married and it was like my first or I think it was my first or second wedding anniversary um, and I said dude it's my anniversary I should get something can you have, do you have any advice and he said yeah they never start the opera on the high note so, <laughs> so, but but how that applies, you know, how that sage wisdom applies is, <laughs> and you know, I can think of I can think of one television producer who I worked for on a couple of different projects. Uh, we've become we've become good friends over the years, and at first he just wasn't, and he was incredibly shy around me. And it turns out he was a had been a serious amateur musician before pivoting into writing and producing television and had become quite successful. But he struggled with having a relationship with a, a composer because it just brought up a lot of things for him emotionally. Cause oh, like he kind unresolved of issues himself, in his own Well, he career. pictured himself being in the music world more, uh, more as a creative, not that, you know, producing, you know, a hit TV show is, 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 you know, a second, you know, a good second place. I think it's it's great. Not that I would trade places with him, but um, what I found was that it was it was a kind of this gentle entry into intimacy. You know, look, you can you can think of coming onto any project like going on a first date. You don't you don't yeah. you don't have the 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 really weird, tough, intimate questions, even if it's going well. You know, yeah. you don't you don't just expect somebody to open up for no reason. Mm. Look, I think it's very obvious in any relationship, whether it's with your therapist or your or a, <laughs> a or a spouse or a partner or a friend or a colleague or a or a collaborator, that people will be as open with you as you are with them. Totally, man. And and there's you know nothing wrong with being the first one to say something. That expresses, you know, not to say, you know, I was, you know, uh, I, I was abused as a child or, or something that's, that's that difficult. Um, you know, often conversations are a bit lighter than that. But right. to talk about vulnerabilities, to talk about failures, to talk about insights, to, to swap stories that indicate, you know, I guess what are called teachable moments, um, those tend to engender conversations, and they can definitely be about non-biz, non-musical things. And the more open you are and do it kind of in a socially appropriate way and kind of read the room and, and don't don't push it and, and don't go too far off uh, target if it feels weird and if they kind of pull you back in, then go, okay, I'll leave it for now. It's, it's about reading the room. And it's about uh, being vulnerable, making it clear that you're there to be there for them. Yeah, of service. That's, a, that's yeah. a good feeling. When somebody says, I will, not, I will not violate your trust. I will not let you down. I'm here. Oh, and it brings up 
the number one most important thing. And this one took me a long time to learn. Because when I get nervous, I get a little chatty. And I try to, I kind of, I don't, I, I, I get nervous around silences. And then it occurred to me that the most important thing you can bring to a collaboration is a very high degree of listening. The minute, you know, when, when, when you're chatty, then there's no room for others. And directors are very used to being heard. Their job is to say, make those costumes blue, make that, put that, put a wide angle lens on that camera, bring up that light, you know, put that actor, have them sit in that chair and then have them walk over to that table. You know, directors are, are, are broadcasters for a living. And if you fill that space up, when, when it's intimate, when it's one-on-one, -on -one, uh, when it's just starting, then there's no sense that you can um, be there to listen when they need you the most. So when I am collaborating, in addition to being open and, and as expressive as I feel I can and should be, I try my best to make it very clear that my job is to listen, hmm. whether it's creative or emotional, professional or non-professional. I've had many filmmakers come to me with personal problems. Yeah, well, people and, come to and people that, those conversations are very good. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, they build again. It builds trust and it builds yeah. fluency because you start. One of the things that you have to do in any relationship is try to speak a common language. You know, and in music, and we were. I was sort of alluding to this earlier, and I don't think I was very clear. You know building a common language with a collaborator means that when somebody says it needs to be tense, that everybody knows what that means. Because my idea of tense could be your idea of catastrophe or right. vice versa. Right. So we all need to know, and you know, it's almost always words of, of an emotional nature. It, it's talking about it needs to be romantic. It needs to be reassuring. It needs to be lonely. It needs to be uh, violent. It needs to be chaotic. You know, these are words, again, this, we don't use, I, you almost never use a musical term. You know, you don't say, well, let's make a, let's put in a decrescendo. Yeah, right. <laughs> even, even, if a, even if a director knows what decrescendo means, and fortunately, very few do. Right. It's not an emotionally it's, it's, conveyance. It's a hundred, yeah. yeah. It's a hundred percent pointless. Yeah. Better to say, you know, what if it fades away? What if it crests and comes back into the water? Those kinds of, that kind of visual language, producers and directors understand visual language. In fact, a producer or director, especially directors, are incredibly savvy about about the process of making film and TV. They understand acting. They understand writing. Many of them are writers. They understand blocking a scene. They understand lighting. They understand the technology, uh, the technical aspects of cinematography, enough to be able to talk to a cinematographer, enough to talk to a lighting designer, enough to talk to a props department, enough to talk to the CG and effects people enough to talk to every single person on a crew. They have enough technical and aesthetic knowledge to understand all of these technical crafts that go into making film and TV, with one exception. Music. Music. Yeah. yeah, so you really got to go out of your way to speak their language. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks. That was a really, I think that was an important topic, and I appreciate your insight on that. Of course. Be Beijing Olympic Games, man. How Beijing hell, Olympics. How did you get that gig? So, a couple years prior, um, I was approached by, so you know what a contractor is, somebody who so hires musicians for recording sessions. Hmm. I'm sorry, a music contractor. Uh, in, if you're in Europe, a fixer. Okay. If you're in the U.S., a contractor. Somebody who brings musicians together for uh, recording sessions, puts orchestras together. And one of my best friends 
was my contractor and and we'd worked together for years on film and TV and he called me up he goes so Jeff and and by the way he was a diehard uh union guy everything he did was strictly uh through the AF of M the American Musicians Union um but clearly there was already an exodus from Los Angeles for uh, composers to record in other cities in order to work on not to do non-union work to do in indie films indie small tv shows video games which are still to this day a kind of an issue with the with the union so there was um <clears throat> there was uh more and more interest in people going to london going to budapest going to bratislava uh going to non-union uh orchestras so my friend calls him up he goes hey look there's this violin player here in LA from Ch he's Chinese and he works half of the year there and half the year here and he plays for me here but he asked me to help him advise on whether or not the orchestra's studios and engineering uh, infrastructure in Beijing was of the caliber to start bringing in uh, Western uh, scores Western composers to score in Beijing because they have these recording studios, they have these great musicians. Um, would you would you go to Beijing with me and advise on whether or not they have what it takes? And I thought, oh, free trip to to China. That kind of sounds interesting. Um, and I said, yes, but there is one caveat. I'm not an engineer. So you can't show me a microphone collection and have me say, <laughs> yes, this is sufficient to record you know, uh, yeah. a 30 piece brass section. I didn't know nothing about that. So I ended up going on a, on a, on a week long tour of Beijing with my contractor friend and my engineer and the three of us and this, and this violin player. And along the way we were, so we went to a, a different studio every day and it was fascinating. It was, it yeah, was, that must have been so cool. Well, some of it made no sense and some of it was like astonishing. Um, and at various times we would meet with interesting musicians and, and, and we started meeting people in the Chinese music, uh, world, pop and film and what have you. And I got to meet some film composers and I got to meet some, uh, pop record producers. And one day, um, I get called into a meeting and it was with the conductor of an orchestra and it was a conductor who had been tasked with coming up with a concert that would be part of the Beijing Olympics. And this was in 2006, so 16, 18 years ago. Mm. And, um, 16, 16, right? Yeah. 16, 16 years ago. Yeah. And, um, he turned to me and said, look, could you create music for the Olympics for his orchestra. His orchestra specifically was in the city of Qingdao, where the beer comes from, Tsingtao beer. Yeah, okay. It comes from the city of Qingdao, is the way they pronounce it. And it's one of the most astonishing cities. It's a coastal city that was built by the Belgians. And it looks like a small European seaside village. In but China. All the architecture is European, and these windy cobblestone streets, something you don't see in any other part of mainland uh, China uh, or any other part of China. And the orchestra was really good. And Qingdao was the city where they decided to hold all of the uh, water events for the Olympics, the regattas, the sailing and rowing. And, and you know, it's, a, it's its own Olympics, but it's all water-based. And they said, do you want to be the composer for all of these events? By writing, in essence, writing a sort of a symphonic work where each movement would have some use in 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 the uh, in the games. So, you know, so that just can't like. So uh, I said, pretty yeah, random. And I ended up spending the next year going back and forth to China, working with the musicians, uh, writing the pieces, getting the pieces approved by strangers who never walked into a room with me um and they'd be very difficult notes to again language was a was a serious yeah. thing but yeah. but it went very well we had a great time and what we what it ended up being is a recording session 
uh, where we took two orchestras, one from this town of Qingdao and from Beijing. We combined them into a hundred plus people, recorded this symphonic suite of music, which I call the Regatta Suite, and you can find it um, on uh, on uh, streaming services. And uh, yeah, I called it Songs of the Sea, the Regatta Suite. And after we recorded everything, we they said, well, look, we want to tour this con as a concert in the week leading up to the opening of the games. So we're going to go from town to town. We're going to go to Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Qingdao, and a couple other places. We're going to just do it, do it live. So we got these hundred musicians and me and a couple of uh, friends. Lisa Gerard worked with me on one. She wrote lyrics for one piece. Um, and so, yeah, so we spent spent a year going back and forth, writing it and, and work, revising it, and then touring with it. Got to conduct once or twice, which was fun. That's cool. Um, and um, then I got out. I left uh, two days before the opening ceremonies, and um, that was that. That was the last time I was in China. Is that, like, the biggest – Is it, uh, if you had a lead with something, like, career-wise, that's a – that's like the one to lead with, I'm assuming, not an uh, like. I don't think so. Really? I mean, uh, again, it's kind of an outlier for me, and um, yeah. and it was an enjoyable experience. It was a kind of parts of it were quite surreal, right. you know. Nothing like uh, writing for a combo of the Olympics Committee and the Communist Party. <laughs> to uh, and there were a couple of weird meetings where there are a lot of people in a room, kind of you know, staring me down. And it's like Jeff, that that piece has to go faster, or you know, you can't you can't do this. And um, yeah, smoking cigarettes. And um, no, it was it was interesting. You know, I I, I can't say I became intimately in, uh, uh, familiar with Chinese culture, but it's it was a challenge. It was exciting. Um, the tour was fun. Uh, the recording sessions were difficult. Huh. Um, trying to get certain notions of what they wanted something Western that the goal was to hire a sort of a get something that sounded vaguely Hollywood. They didn't right. want they didn't want traditionally Chinese sounding music for the Olympics. This was China's opportunity to step into the world stage for media in a way right. that they had never done. So the 2008 Olympics uh, were to set the tone for uh, a more worldly China, and um, I don't know that they succeeded. Um, you know, they're fiercely proud of their culture, and and uh, Western music holds a very small place in the in the uh, ears of of China, and I don't think that's really changed. You know, their their access, not their access, but their interest in Western pop music, very limited. Hmm. I mean, look, they have the internet. They they know who Harry Styles is, um, but um, there there is a strong preference for their own their own music, pop, opera, classical, um, you know, you you name it, jazz, um, all comes from their own culture and not isn't steeped in in Western culture so much. And I think I had to tre uh, tread a little bit of an interesting fine line of that. But anyway, that's the Olympics. I, after weird? that, I've scored a couple of... Um, I've scored uh, a number of video games that came out of China. Um, I scored one uh, feature film a couple years ago, Chinese uh, film. And, um, you know, actually, since the Olympics, uh, it's generally been to be more aware of and thoughtful of Chinese instruments and Chinese music. So what I've done since then has been much more uh, of a hybrid. Did a lot of, did those gigs or some of those gigs post Olympics come from your work at the Olympics indirectly? Indirectly. I think I, I you know, I sort of passed the test a little bit in right. China. So my name, uh, my name and my music was already somewhat known by yeah. certain people. So I think it gave a few people a little bit of a sense of safety with me. Right. That, right. that I sense. wasn't, you know, pure Western Hollywood 
you know, weirdo. Well, ultimately, too, you know, the the the, the government has to sign off on stuff, and they yeah. obviously signed off on your stuff. That's a big hurdle. The one less stressor to deal with, you know. Oh, yeah. this guy knows the program here. He's, he's not going to come in and you know destroy the system or try to you know ruffle feathers. And I'm sure that is a big thing something there. like that. Uh, I want to ask you how you got connected with the following people you've worked with, and if there is a uh, how how did you first meet them, and also if you have a cool or interesting or funny story about uh, any any bit of your experience working with them. Let's start with Brian Eno. Right. So, um, Cause, excuse me one second. I just you're the first person in 900 guests that's worked with Eno. Now I oh, had wow. a guy on my show. Um, his wife used to date <laughs> Eno, but uh, I, you're the first person I met. Yeah. All right. Well, <clears throat> I, I I didn't date him, so um, <laughs> I'm not judging. <laughs> you know, I I so my my experience with him was was somewhat brief in terms of my direct work with him, um, but when I was in uh, the band with John Hassel. One of the few times that I've done anything live, it's, it's not been my thing. You know, I've done a handful of live shows in my life. Um, but, you know, working with John Hassel, John and Brian had a, you know, a decades long relationship and, and collaboration, you know, my starting with my life in the Bush of Ghosts and possible musics. And, you know, Brian has been involved producing some of Hassel's things. And if you haven't heard John Hassel or of John Hassel. He just passed away a, a, a year or so ago. Um, and we stayed in touch, um, although he started to kind of get more... He, he suffered from dementia the last few years. Uh -huh. But um, uh, John Hassel is, 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 is a revolutionary. I think he's, a, he, a, again, one of these people who was never interested in fads or trends musically, but was probably one of the first people, people to sample African music and use it as material into other kinds of music. And um, again, I met John through some mutual friends. Uh, again, I think like my meeting with, uh, like my meeting Hans Zimmer, you know, through somebody selling him a sampler. I think, I think I met John through somebody who sold him a pedal, like a, like a looper pedal. And, um, Again, we hit it off, and he was just starting an album with a with a new band, and he invited me to be in it. And um, and so, you know, I learned a lot about working, working what it was like to work with Brian through John before meeting Brian. And I didn't meet Brian until we did a live show. In uh, we did two or three nights in uh, New York, and it was a collaboration with uh, with Eno, and part of it was a. a an installation that he had done um, in the atrium of the World Trade Center, you know, no longer with us. Yeah. And um, it was this beautiful space. And the idea was that he had done this sound installation with sounds from the Amazon, but that each night uh, the John Hassel band would get up on stage and we would sort of crossfade from his installation into ours, but that he was mixing and, and sort of producing uh, our, our work. And... Um, so we did uh, a number of rehearsals and we would get up there and it's the music is planned, but it's 100 percent improvised. You know, there are some existing materials. Each song, each piece of music had a series of sounds or samples or rhythms or a drum machine thing. And I, was, I was playing keys and drum pads and sa triggering samples and, you know, all kinds of, you know, stranger things. And it was me, guitar, bass and a drummer slash percussionist, and then John on trumpets and, and a few synthesizers. And um, after our rehearsals, uh, we'd go backstage or to the little green room and Brian would be there and he would, um, one time he had these, he, he had these three by five cards that he had typewritten with a typewriter and uh, from in his hotel about the previous night. And, um, you know, he would just go through these cards and just very dispassionately just say, 
I think in such and such a piece, some of it's too bright. And, you know, <laughs> again, there's this language that, that, you know, speaks. And uh, I got to, you know, I got to spend time with Brian. We had some meals together. We got to talk about all kinds of things together. And then we, we did the, the, the album, City, and he's, he's credited as a co-producer, as am I. Um, and then um, eventually that album ended up at Warp Records. And it's being, um, it got re-released just a couple of years ago. And uh, our concert with Brian is coming out as a live album this year, I believe. Oh, that's on, on random. Warp. And then, and then the guitar player ended up uh, recording with Brian for the next couple of years. And, Who is the guitar um, player? Uh, Greg Aragine. Oh, the same guy. The same You're, guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Again, because he was just a a sonic wizard, hmm. um, and and a very had a very unusual approach. Although he was also very soulful as well. So you know, we did these live shows, but his influence, you know, uh, you know, said something very profound. Um, somebody asked him what what it meant to be a record producer. What what was that r job? And he said, "I'm a filter." And that's a really good way of looking at it. And, and I'll give you a, a, an example of what that means. So with the John Hassel project, the way, the way our album City came about is um, we would get together in John's living room here in L.A. and we'd improvise for two or three hours nonstop. And an improvisation what might start off as a loop that he had created or a sound, or a sample, or a drum loop, or a, or a rhythm, or a guitar phrase. Some little tiny, almost insignificant germ. And John would record the entire afternoon. Then we would go away, and about three days later, he'd call us up individually and say, come over. And you'd go over, and he'd, say, and he'd hand you uh, a recording, and he'd say, these were my favorite parts of the improvisation that we did. Focus on those and figure out how you did that. And we're going to rehearse again this Saturday. Saturday would come and we would do that. And then he would do it again. And again. Filter the filter. And again. Okay. And he kept And we did this for weeks. Weeks and actually into months. And what happened was with each one, he was the filter. So yeah. what started off as just fucking around eventually became a little bit more refined, a little bit more refined, and eventually they started to break apart, and this would be track one and track two and track three and track four, each from a little kernel of something. Somebody might just do some weird little noise, some little sweeping little sparkle, and go, oh, I like that. Do that again. And so I think what I've embraced from the, the Eno slash Hassel approach is... Be be brave, be unfettered, be experimental. There are no wrong answers. But then go back and focus in on the best parts and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again. And eventually you get to make the judgment call it's done or the clock simply runs out. And so, so I think my good, compositional technique yeah. as a as a film and TV and video game composer is fuck around, then see if any of it sticks. And if it does, use that as the germ for a continuation and a refinement and an expansion, and then refine it and expand it and refine it and expand it. And composition as, as filtration. Thanks. Good, good story. Talk about Maurice White, because you mentioned him earlier. Um, Maurice. I spent a couple of years with Maurice. So Maurice was the drummer, singer, co-writer, and, and leader and producer of Earth, Wind, and Fire. You know, one of the most seminal figures going back to the 70s in Chicago, in the funk and R&B scene, into creating one of the most iconic bands in the world. And I met him, uh, you know, after all of that. And I had been programming synths for various studio musicians. 
And I met uh, his keyboard player, a guy named Bill Myers. And Bill Myers, not, not, not very many people know who Bill Myers is, but Bill Myers is a jazz and R&B composer, Grammy nominated, um, and uh, was keyboardist for everybody from Madonna to Earth, Wind and & Fire and tons of other characters. Um, a very successful string arranger, but he wasn't very good with synthesizers. He didn't really, he played them immaculately. He was, had unbelievable musicianship, but he wasn't good at, at, he had sounds in his head, but he didn't know how to create them and he didn't know how to sample. And so I ended up working for him for a, a, a while and I worked on one of his, I worked on that album that got nominated for a Grammy and the name of the album is, um, uh, escaping me at the moment, but we'll we'll come back to it, and it can be in the show notes. A brilliant album in which we recorded it directly to a mastering lathe, cutting a lacquer master, where we did an entire side of the album in one take. Because once the lathe starts cutting, so there was this record label that was do, tr doing this experimental thing, where you had to do an entire side of an album. Um, and, the, and you know, look, this was already, there were already CDs and, and digital, uh, but they wanted, they had this idea that it would go directly to a, and they had Bernie Grundman, uh, the, the famous mastering engineer, um, sitting, uh, they had Bill Schnee as the mixer, feeding directly, they had, they used to have, their buildings were adjacent, and they literally drilled a hole in the wall and fed a stereo cable between his board and the mastering lathe, and they cut a lacquer master where with a big band and some singers and uh, an A-list rhythm section and me and one other synth guy with sequencers. And, you know, God, things could fuck up so easily. But we, we cut the first side after we did it in two takes, and we cut the second side in two takes because that was all the money they had. They could not afford to go right. another, another minute. But Bill Myers ended up being Earth, Wind & Fire's uh, string and brass um, uh, arranger. And they used to have these kind of big, over-the-top orchestral interludes in their live shows. And Bill did those. So Bill started helping Maurice. Now Maurice White was getting into producing other artists. Okay. Um, so not just Earth, Wind & Fire, but... Um, uh, Bill introduced me. He said, "You know, Maurice, this is the guy who kind of helps make this go." And he goes, "Oh, dude, let's let's come on over." And yeah. Maurice had a little studio on the corner of Hollywood and Vine in this office building, and we did. I worked on a couple of smaller Earth, Wind, and Fire projects, and then we scored a video. Uh, we scored an anime series uh, together, and then I just helped him out on whatever. So drum sampling, drum programming, synth programming. Uh, sequencing, coming up with cool, you know, uh, electronic stuff. And, you know, Maurice, he was, I mean, he was a fucking genius. Nice guy, incredibly warm, incredibly uh, generous. Had a, you know, for him, to him, music was all about warmth, both sonically in terms of like, the dynamic range and the, 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 the frequency range of music, but also that every note meant something about about what the song was trying to convey. And that every every voicing, every strum, every every hit, every drum thing, everything had to f fall in line with what what he wanted the music to feel like to the listener. And I, I have to say his he was he was incredibly good in the studio. You know, he was the first person I really got to spend quality time with in a recording studio. And he was fabulous. I, I had a great time. That's a cool story to get to hang with someone that, of that musical caliber for that long and that intense. That's pretty, pretty good opportunity, man. Oh, invaluable. Where, where did you grow up? You grew up in L.A. or? Right here in Los Angeles. Culver City High. Go Culver sometimes. City High. There you go. I was there. I think I tell you that I was in Culver City. You did actually. Yeah, I was in Culver. I never. That was my first time in LA. This is just three months ago. 
you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, wait, you've never been to LA up until three months ago. I mean, just in a plane, mm-hmm. just like changing huh? planes. No, I, I, I that doesn't count. I know it doesn't. an airport and, uh, is not a city. <laughs> <laughs> but the odd thing was, I'm out at lunch and I turn around and there's a guy who was on my show that I haven't seen in like three and a half years, and uh, my buddy John Defaria uh, was uh, said this happened. This is that's L.A. and you know, I guess that's the thing there. <laughs> uh, all right, so you grew up. In, what was your childhood like? Um. I enjoyed it. You know, I survived. <laughs> I I am first generation. My parents uh, were immigrants from Eastern Europe, from Hungary. They were concentration camp survivors. Oh, my God. Um, they managed to get out after they were liberated. They didn't get out before then. Uh, took them a long time to get out of, to get on a boat to uh, America. Um they had a couple of relatives who had escaped and ended up somehow in L.A., and so they ended up coming here to reunite with family members. And um, I have, you know, I'm the, I'm the baby. I'm the third of three uh, kids. Um, at the time, America was not quite the melting pot in that there wasn't an interest in retaining one's culture. It was all about steeping oneself in whatever was considered American culture at the time. And so I grew up in a very, what I would call conventional, you know, middle class American Mm. West Coast environment, you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, didn't play sports very well, played some music, wasn't really serious about it. Uh, I had an uncle who was a professional and a very successful uh, photographer, and uh, he taught me photography and I thought, oh, this is a cool, this could be a cool gig. I, I kind of get it. Um, you know, so by the time I got to high school, I started getting more interested in music, although I didn't think of it as a career. My parents did not support the idea of me going into music. You know, they considered it a perfectly fine hobby. Right. But, you know, but accountants make money. You know, right. accountants, doctors, yeah, yeah, all this yeah. stuff. Well, I wasn't. They they know I wasn't going to be a doctor, but uh, accountant was you know worked for them. So right. <laughs> um, you know, I I didn't grow up with the idea of following in in into something like that, but you know, being a freelancer, if you will, and um, that was that. You know, I graduated high school barely. Was not a good student. Went to college, dropped out. Didn't did not did not get on, um, but that's when I started to get more interested in music. Had some private teachers. One of my most important teachers was a Bulgarian jazz pianist named Milcho Leviev, who just passed away a couple years ago, who taught me how to be open minded. Actually, both of my music teachers. There used to be a I don't know if you've ever heard of him. There used to be a weird avant garde big band here in L.A. Uh, run by a trumpet player named Don Ellis. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So Don Ellis was my just my hero when I was in high school. Um, you know, he would have a big band with because I played in, the, in my high school big band, um, but he had a big band with quarter tone trumpets and a French horn, an electric French horn section, an electrified string quartet, and he was uh, integrating Indian ragas into the music and odd time meters, and then he brought this this crazy Bulgarian pianist into, you know, to L.A. and started writing using Bulgarian rhythms that were like, you know, 17 plus 19 over 16 time. And I learned how to do all that. You know, I learned. So eventually I became the, the lead sax player and this keyboard player became my my teachers. And Milcho taught me because he had a band and so he had a Fender Rhodes. And so the deal was if I was his roadie and I would bring his Fender Rhodes to his gigs at jazz clubs and concerts that he would teach me. So by the time I was done, I had completely destroyed the backseat of my car. It was shredded down to the foam and springs. And, um, but I traded those, you know, you know, almost every week. And plus I had a Fender Rhodes the rest of the time. So that was nice. Yeah, but that thing—that was the big stage piano, the, the one with the built-in speaker. That thing weighed a fucking ton, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I traded, and, and I, I think it was an important thing for me because it was learning 
that you could be very open-minded but still disciplined. And that was kind of a new idea uh, to me as a 20-something. What's interesting is that you have totally made a career by being in a very specific niche in this synth electronica situation and you did it solely because that's what you liked right i guess you know um because growing up and as i was as i started to get more serious about music i had a skill i i had a, a skill to trade you know i was useful because i learned sampling and programming and and these all these production skills that were still kind of fresh that's that's what lb gluten wanted me to do right. that's what malcolm cecil wanted me to do so all of these kind of legendary ish musicians um needed somebody with a new skill set that they were still trying to grasp and they wanted to go fast so i was a shortcut yeah, but what I was going to say was the amazing thing is the number one thing, and this is over 900 interviews, so it's it's not a like you know global population, but it's a pretty good population to get this. Oh one. yeah, number one characteristic that successful music musicians and people in music business have in common is support from their parents by far like not like really? over like maybe 98 99 percent yeah mm. so that i mean something that it's just very unique that that you took this just a sincere passion and just like ran with it and made a whole life out of it that's not uncommon. i guess it's not common it's very uncommon so pat yourself on the back for whatever was inside you to do that <clears throat> well you know i i I couldn't figure out a better way to piss my parents off. You know, <laughs> maybe that, I, I, hey, I, I righteous indignation gets you really I, I, far, man. <laughs> you know, I wasn't like lighting shit on fire. I wasn't like committing, you know, uh, misdemeanors. Yeah. But they sure did not want me to go into the arts. And, yeah. you know, I showed them. <laughs> yeah. I did not have that in mind, by the way. Yeah. I just look, I, I, I felt I, I spent a lot of my life doing my best to reassure them yeah. that it was OK not to have stability to not have uh consistency in in my financial situation and i ran out of money lots yeah well i could understand you know they come to this country and god what they had to deal with in their life i i, I mean there's no way you can imagine you can't imagine that something like that you know it's like yeah it's like being pregnant you can't imagine what it's like being pregnant if you haven't been pregnant you know um yeah I can tell you the one enduring aspect of having parents who have gone through something as horrific as that. Yeah, please. Is perspective. And for some reason, well, no, for that reason, I have been allergic to complaining my whole life. You know, when somebody says, you right know, on. can you believe it took 10 minutes to get my latte at Starbucks right? <laughs> I just think to myself... Are you fucking kidding me? I know, man. Uh, really? It? That's 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 the worst you got. I've I have yet to think of one thing that's happened in my life that's of value to complain about. Dude, I am with you. I have no. And I've had some shitty that. things happen, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, challenging things, challenging yeah. things, you know. So yeah, I get it. I get it. So you, will anyway. Yeah, that's fucking amazing. Speaking of challenging things, what were some low points or dark periods you've had to go through and how'd you get through them? Well, on the personal side, you know, plenty, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know. It's all relative. But, you know, my first marriage failed. I've had some other relationships go pretty bad. Um, it's better now. Um, I've had to work on myself a lot over the years and and um, that's been that's sort of the good thing that's come out of those dark things I've certainly run out of you know I've had financial instability at various times as an adult and um, you know again when you're divorced can really change things you know I feel for those you know 
uh, you know, you hear those very successful songwriters and you go, wow, you know, you wrote all these hit songs. You must be very wealthy. And they'll, you know, well, I've been married three times. So, you know, do the math. <laughs> cut, you know? cut. Yeah. yeah, divided by half, divided by half, divided by half. Right, right. That that That's a very small part of it. You know, mm. I've almost never been fired from a, a job, but I've been let go on a few occasions. Um, it's normal. I've never met a composer, How including the A-listers, yeah. who have not had something thrown away. And for me, it's only been a, uh, maybe a handful of times, you know, but those have been very difficult times because not that you're only as good as your, your last job, but, you know, you're only as successful as your last achievement. And, you know, word gets out that you, um, you know, that you screwed up, that you got let go off a project for musical reasons, for personal reasons, uh, for any reason. It doesn't even matter. Um, it feels, you know, it's sort of like every job's my last job. And um, so, you know, I have to take everything. I do take things very seriously. And those times when things have not gone well and, you know, rewinding to the beginning of this conversation, often because communication was in some way lacking and I did not, you know, read the room. Um, those have been difficult times only because you, you worry that it's going to be permanent. But it never is. At least it's never has been uh, for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, composers are a little bit, unlike actors and directors for whom a bomb can really derail a career, I know composers have scored horrific films or, or projects. And, you know, you don't get any jobs from it, but you don't necessarily lose your your standing. It doesn't help, but, you know, doesn't doesn't ruin you. But it's it, it can be very... Uh, difficult. So, you know, yeah. Plus, every so often, I've put trust in certain people who have let me down. You know, uh, business people. Uh, you know, you hear about people being screwed by managers and uh, accountants and lawyers. And full disclosure, I have been. Yeah. And when those things have happened... I've come to realize that none of that stuff happens if you don't let it happen. Unfortunately. And what that means is you're, you're either kind of intensely gullible or you're willing to not read the red flags. So when I look back at the, at the times that I've, that I've been really devastated, and it hasn't been that long, you know, it's been a while, but I, I've, gotten, I've, I've gotten cheated two or three times where when I look back, I thought to myself, Oh, how could I, how did I not see that? You know, how did I not see that coming? And, um, I've treated each of those as a learning experience because if you don't learn from it, it you know, if you don't learn from history, it, you know, it does tend to repeat itself. <laughs> and there are people, there are predatory people who prey on the, the trust of good natured people. Um, so hasn't changed. I, my, my view of humanity doesn't change from it, but my view of my ability to trust my gut to say something here doesn't feel right. And before I step, you know, take another step forward, I got to read this. Yeah. And, um, and that's been invaluable. So, yeah, I think my low points have been related to trust and violation of that trust um, worries about the future that we have no control over. You know, not being in the present moment is a dangerous thing. Not, not, not just embracing now, you know, and, 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 and not to get too, uh, uh, spiritual about it, but spending one's life in the future is, is fruitless as fruitless as spending time in the past, mm -hmm. except for the, except for the educational value of it. Thank you for uh, sharing that. And I agree with a lot of the things, you, especially about spending time in the future. I, and I have a close friend of mine and, you know, we call each other and, uh, and he'll tell me something he's worried about. And I'll say, hey, man, your, your future tripping. And I'm like, holy shit, you're right. Thank you. 
you know, or he'll say it to me, you know, hey, stop future. I'm like, you know what, thanks. And mm-hmm. I think you're right. Spending time in the present is more <clears> than the safe, safest and, like, spiritually, it's, like, one of the most n- normal, comforting peaceful for me anyway to do and i'm not a guy who spent much time in the present until the last few years and well you know the question is is great how do you stay in the present moment while still being ambitious because ambition is about the future and ambition is actually a pretty strong driving force in one's artistic or professional career isn't it yeah it is um that's an that's an, an interest. I had s- so many things happen to me that I just, for me, I'm, I, 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 I almost can't even. I'm just focusing on getting through today. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I, you know, the days are so full. It's like I don't have bandwidth. I've I've reduced my available bandwidth. Is, is a weird thing. I have not. <laughs> oh, I've no. It's what I've done. I've consciously reduced my available bandwidth to focus more on on you know he being wherever I'm doing, just doing it. Whereas in like you said, when you're uh, when you tend to not do that, at least for me anyway, I would always be thinking about okay, what do I got to do tomorrow? What do, Mm-hmm. I, sure. I don't have that conversation with myself anymore, and I find I get I find after several years of doing that, of working hard, I'm still working hard at it. That it's uh, I'm, I'm I can't do that. I don't want it. it stresses me out, and I don't get stressed out easy. No, you are but my I, I sensei just, then. No, Good I'm for you. I'm very much working on this on a regular basis because I <laughs> of the value because I feel better when I'm Good. doing that. You know, but Great. I know what you're saying. Thanks for answering that question. Uh, along the same lines, what what are some personality traits that do you, that you have, Jeff, that you feel has been attributable to some of your success? Um. Well, number one is being open. Just I'm I'm not an open book. I don't think. Um. But I think it's viewing life as opportunities and not as as problems. I think I am by nature a problem solver, which has bitten me on the ass a few times, but um, not professionally. I feel that people, I, I seem to be able to build a rapport fairly quickly, and I think that's because... I find people fascinating. I'm interested in people a lot. You know, I feel that I have something to learn from literally everybody I meet in any walk of life. I'm, I'm, I find myself interested in, in the world. I like engaging with the world. I like engaging with humans in the world. And I like making art. And I love being in the present moment. And I, I love to share what inspires me. You know, I, I'm enthusiastic uh, a lot of the time. Not always, but... And then I'm not afraid to work hard. So... Um, yeah, you have a great work ethic. I try, you know. It sounds better than it really is, but I try. And and so I feel that I've been blessed to have had these opportunities, you know, that have sort of fallen on me in unexpected ways. And I feel like I have an attitude that most people get on with, not all. And, you know, I've certainly had some some relationships not work out, and that's fine. You, you know, if everybody likes you, you are doing something That's not wrong. statistically possible, man. It's not statistically possible. It's just not, man. It's really not. So I think my I think ultimately the thing that defines me above everything else is curiosity. It's just that I I find myself to be a very curious person and I'm willing to explore whatever comes up that might satisfy that itch. And if that's a a project with another person, it's all going to be fueled by that that curiosity. And if you're curious, then then you do have to be a good listener, because if if you know, 
I don't remember who it was that said, you know, God speaks when you're listening. And, and, and I don't see that in a spiritual or religious way, just that the world only can speak. The world speaks to us, but very quietly. And you have to have some quiet and silence in order to hear it. And sometimes those are these very brief moments that come and go in a, in a, in a flash so short but um i think those are the things that that i feel most connected to in my personality thank and, you and i tell a lot of bad jokes you haven't said i've, I've jokes. really worked so hard not to do it on this you, you thing, haven't said any my, 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 do you want to try to tell you want to tell I, so I, I will not. No, absolutely not. But thank you, thank, <laughs> thank you for inviting me to prove to prove that point. No, I, my, my kids roll their eyes at me 24 um, seven. That's OK. That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah, that gets better. Once they leave, it's totally changes, man. Are they, oh, they've are left. Kids? They've oh, left. they left. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Well, but it's still fresh. Yeah. <laughs> how did you talk about how you got into uh, you know, liquid cinema and, and how that, you know, what is, tell everybody what it is ah. and how did that come about? At the time, uh, in the early aughts, I had a room in my, my studio was with Hans Zimmer and there were a number of other composers there, uh, film composers, Harry Gregson Williams was across the hall from me. John Powell was down the hall, uh, a whole, a whole list of great, composers who went on to be kind of A-listers from that point forward. Um, and one day, I was working on a TV show at the time, and um, I forget which one I was working on, but I was writing this kind of pretty melodic uh, music, which I was still kind of getting used to doing after doing weird sound design -y dark shit. Um, I was doing this kind of uplifting um, uh, C major then. I wasn't that sophisticated. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't brave enough for D major. So... Um, um, one day out of the blue, there's a knock on my door because we all shared a hallway and a stranger pokes his head in and he goes, what's, what's that? And by the way, strangers poke your head in all the time back, uh, at, at, uh, uh, remote control. And, um, and, um, I said, oh, I'm scoring such and such a TV show. He goes, I love that piece. Could you write six pieces like that and give them to me? <laughs> I said, I, I could pretty quickly because I'm, I'm, I'm really in the groove on this style. He goes, that would be amazing. I said, cool. Who are you? And he said, well, my name is Rupert Gregson Williams. He, he went on. He's the guy who scored uh, Wonder Woman and a bunch of other huge movies. Because my name is Rupert and um, I run a music library. I license music. And I said, wow, what's a library? This was complete gibberish to me. And so he explained that back in England... Um, which is where he lived at the time and still does, although he was living in L.A. for about a decade. Um, he had started up a small catalog that was distributed by EMI, which at the time was called KPM in, in, their, in their library licensing. So I wrote six tracks for this guy, and it was on an album. It was me and it was just two of us who had written on this. And, you know, the, the, no relation, no connection. We never met, but it was this guy, Guy Fletcher who most people would know is the keyboard player from Dire Straits. So I don't know why Guy Fletcher had time for this, but uh, <laughs> I had time. So I wrote six tracks. He wrote six tracks. This album comes out. And within a couple of years, Oprah Winfrey latches on to three of my tracks of the six. Oh, man. And they get used easily 10,000 times over a period of, about, of almost a decade. And that's like heroin. Taking heroin the first so, time, right? <laughs> when you're so when you that, have that kind of magnitude. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Anyway, that put me on this rather fascinating path of, first of all, the president of EMI being in L.A., a guy named Peter Cox at the time, was running it. Um, and he's now over at West One Music uh, with his son, Edwin. But uh, Peter said, hey, I'm going to be in L.A., I've heard your music. It's really cool. I'd love to just meet and say hello. So I, I meet the head of, of EMI production music, KPM, and we had a great time. And he introduces me 
to the people in L.A. who are their distributors, which is a company called APM, Associated Production Music. The, the number one licensing entity in the U.S., however, they're 50% owned by EMI and 50% owned by Universal, but they function uh, independently. Anyway, that, that meeting led to me suddenly meeting people from the library world. So I started writing for other libraries. Um, I started writing for... Uh, a German company called Sonaton, uh, a small LA company called, um, oh, I can't even remember, but uh, not that good, and they don't pay their bills. But um, <laughs> so, so uh, I, I won't give you that for the show notes. Um, <laughs> I wrote for maybe three or four different library companies, and I started bringing friends of mine, my, my, my colleagues, and my, even my assistant, and we'd put out, you know, the various tracks. And then one day, I get a phone call from the president of APM, and he goes, you do music for trailers, don't you? And I, I never had, but I said, yes, of course. So he goes, well, I have a situation, and maybe you're the answer. We're getting more involved in, tra in licensing music into trailers, and our number one uh, production company that produces music for trailers, the two partners got into a huge fight. They don't want to talk to each other. They won't write together. The company has really kind of gone on the shelf, and we need a company that will provide us a minimum of six albums a year. It's a commitment for five years. You're either in or you're out. What will it be? And I started to say no. And literally my assistant back then said, Jeff, say yes. We'll do this together. And we ended up starting a, a library called Liquid Cinema. And it started off with six albums. Um, and those six albums had, at the time, the track, a huge track count, like 20, 30 tracks. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I mean, I really didn't know what I was doing, but I believed in the music. And within one year, 100% of our tracks licensed. Get in out of here. one year. Unheard of. 100% and now today, of uh, yeah, uh, that has, that's, that's not the case anymore. That was six albums in uh, 2009. Okay. Um, I actually recorded some of the strings when I was in Beijing. Uh, they didn't know this, but they actually played on uh, on, on some of my library stuff. And so, um, flash forward 12 years, and now we're 250 albums. Wow. And we're amongst the most successful independent licensing production companies in uh, North America. With And we've been global for a long time, but... Um, we're working very closely with Universal Music outside of North America, working with APM in North America. We also provide uh, custom music for both companies at times. Um, we've split into three catalogs, one that's primarily on trailers called Liquid Cinema, one that's on kind of source music and underscore and, you know, beds for reality shows, and that's called Inside Tracks. And now we've started up an ind indie song label called Inside Cuts that just started up this year. So that's still actually quite fresh. And is do you license only your own music? Or you mean is, this... is it me? Oh, I write very little of it now. Yeah, I mean, do you take music from from other people? You know, oh, from absolutely. Other... Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Okay, so you've, yeah. You okay. know, I write a few tracks a year. My t I have a, a team of people who are who write, but, you know, we, we work with songwriters, record producers, some composers on, on film and TV stuff, but we're folks focused more on hip hop, pop, rock. We've collaborated with some astonishingly talented uh, people in a number of, of genres. And, um, you know, you can go to liquidcinema.com or you can go onto the uh, APM or the Universal website and do a search for Liquid Cinema where our sub-labels will show up, Inside Tracks and Inside Cuts, and you can see what we're all about. Jeff, so I want to talk about your company, Liquid Cinema, yeah, uh, which is a very large production company. As the owner of a music library, what interesting things have you learned about who licenses mu who licenses music, why they license it, and and what they're actually looking for? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, the short answer is there is an incredibly broad range of people and companies licensing music for for use in media. So, um, 
the diversity of the clientele is an indication of the diversity of the music itself, right? Interesting. So yeah. um, it it begins with who doesn't license music from a library. So um, you know, in film and television and high profile media. Um, <clears throat> The, the first thing that goes on is music supervisors are the people who go out and choose music that isn't custom music, that isn't a work for hire where you hire a composer, which is my world. I am a work for hire. But uh, music supervisors go out and license music, and they usually start with publishing companies and record labels to license well-known material, you know, recognizable, well-known material. If they can't afford the... Um, the masters of, of that, they may commission uh, uh, an artist to do cover because that costs Which is far, so far less. common. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. Uh, the masters you typically far more expensive uh, than the publishing on most uh, songs. But um, beyond that, that's when the library world kicks in. And when you think about the incredible amount of, of instrumental music that you hear throughout uh, television, film, games, promos, trailers, adverts, you name it. It's profound. So um, it, you, you start with sports. Right. Um, sports broadcasts, uh, baseball, football, basketball, soccer, FIFA, uh, you, you name it. Um, it. They have a voracious appetite for music in certain styles. And we'll come back to certain styles. Hmm. <clears throat> you have the advertising world in which probably 80, 85, 90% of the music is licensed. Used to be 100% of it was custom written. Then over the years, that just shifted. Trailers, um, probably another 80% of it is licensed from specialized production companies, of which Liquid Cinema is one, uh, that specialize in the unique aspects of writing trailer music um so then you have broadcasters so if you're abc nbc cbs fox cw in between the shows you have an incredible amount of promo material you know next week on next week's episode you know new show coming out a uh, new season new new episode and all of that music, and again, uh, almost entirely licensed. So the vast majority of, of licensed music tends to be in the advertising promo and broadcast world. Um, it, goes, it goes beyond that because there's content creators, people licensing music for their YouTube channels, their right. Twitch channels, uh, their social media Although social media mostly gets their music for free, because if you're doing an Instagram or a TikTok, you can pick from their in-house library and use that music for free. Although TikTok and Instagram pay right. royalties for the use of the of their in 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 app um, music. To go further, um, in in a television show, a documentaries, uh, they may not have the budget to a hire a composer to do everything, B, be able to afford uh, high-profile, uh, well-known songs. So they will license a ton of music uh, for casual use. So um, you're watching a TV show, and there's a scene in a club, in a, in a bar, in a restaurant, in a public space, and there's you know music playing in the space. That music is almost entirely licensed from libraries like Liquid Cinema. So... <clears throat> To, to sort of encapsulate the whole thing, um, when, when I got started, I came from a background of, of writing um, film and television underscore. So I was very used to writing tense beds and, and uh, dramatic moments, and I wrote a lot of that. And generally speaking, that doesn't license very much. Usually when somebody wants that sort of thing, they'll often um, get somebody to do it. Oh, you know, I left out another massive category of, of licensing, and that's reality shows. Oh, yeah. Every, everything from house flipping to cupcakes to uh, you, you name it. Every competition show, every reality show, 
other than maybe a theme song, it's it's eighty to ninety to a hundred percent licensed from libraries. So, within the scope of everything I just said, between trailers and promos and docs and 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 uh, in uh, source music inside of episodes and reality, there are there are certain grooves that keep showing up again and again in terms of what gets used. Um, Generally speaking, introspective music doesn't have a big home in the licensing world of libraries. If somebody wants, you know, a quiet James Blunt song, they'll they'll probably license from a from a record label. It doesn't come up very often, not never, but introspective music, music that's highly personal, music where uh, with lyrics, um, and especially the lyrics that are very poignant and personal. Uh, our catalog does a ton of songs, but we very intentionally steer the lyrics towards being uh, not generic, but uh, very open to interpretation. Non-specific to a particular non situation. Yeah, so, that makes sense. <clears throat> so we license a massive amount of hip-hop, rock, not a ton of EDM. Um, EDM doesn't seem to have a a real place in most licensing. Um, a lot of dramatic, like tr what we would call trailer music, meaning big and epic and highly emotional music, either, oh my God, the world's about to end, or oh my God, the beauty of it all. Um, those have a, a, real, uh, a real place um, because they come up again and again. Reality shows love trailer music because it gets to the point really fast. It has a build, you know, unlike underscore, which kind of is flat and easy to edit. Trailer music has this big arc yeah. up into this massive climax and then a nice, uh, <clears throat> you know, coda, coda to it. And it's often in three or four acts with little breaks. There's a kind of a science behind library music and making it highly editable being very careful not to make uh, make it challenging to re-edit things. Sure. We provide everything in stems. We have cut downs. Um, we have break points where there's literally just gaps in in the music. You can't really listen to it by itself. It's it's designed for for easy uh, editing. And stems have become um, <clears throat> almost almost requirement. So who licenses our music? The answer is just about everybody, but the music tends to move towards uh, energy, uh, positivity, um, drama, and and uh, and emotion. Generally speaking, it has to be music that is highly emotional, and music that's highly intellectual uh, tends not to really have a place. And and an interesting example, and you know, you can argue with me if the word intellectual is. Is is sort of uh, you know a pejorative, but um, you don't see a lot of need for jazz in the library world. Jazz is a very is a very it's is, is a very sophisticated medium. Hmm. It's not that it never gets used. Sometimes you hear some light breezy, you know, trio stuff, but like real jazz, almost never, almost or Prague never. either. I would assume, correct. Yeah, there hasn't really been um, <clears throat> uh, uh, much of a use for progressive rock. We have a little bit in our, our catalog. You and I spoke about a composer named Adam Wakeman, who's yeah. uh, a big, who's a big, who's really big in the library world, and yeah. I work with him. His father's Rick Wakeman. Right. So Adam, who is oddly not not a prog rocker per se although he and his father have collaborated on many albums but right. he has a, but uh, adam has a long history with um ozzy osbourne and black sabbath yeah. for 15 years um and his rock music gets a lot a lot of licensing and i'll, I'll tell you another thing that licenses quite well is anything that speaks of nostalgia like from the 60s and 70s nostalgia or, or any well, era? Well, in, in the past, the 60s and 70s and even 80s have had a profound place in music licensing. Right this minute, there's an amazing resurgence in, in interest in 90s culture. I think the next generation has started to get a little nostalgic 
you know, those kids born in the 70s and 80s. Right. And now looking at the 90s and, and, and you know, the theme song to Friends. And Well, if you watched this year's um, Super Bowl, uh, we tend to get a, at least one or two tracks licensed into one of those Super Bowl commercials uh, every year. And I couldn't help but notice this year that the theme was so 90s. You know, that they had a, a commercial with a cast of Friends and Scrubs and 90s hip-hop, the, the halftime show with uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Dre, Dre and, Snoop and Snoop and yeah. Eminem and Mary J. Blige. All 90s, you know, all artists who yeah. did in the 90s. So, in a nutshell, um, we, we find that there's a very eclectic range of of people who license our music. I mean, we're actually a relatively boutique company still, um, but we do five or 6,000 licenses every month. Dude, that's awesome. Congratulations. That's freaking amazing. Yeah. Now, the way a lot of that works is through what are called blanket licenses or annual licenses. A big, big company, say ESPN, right? Um, they don't have time to, to license a track. They don't have time to do the paperwork to say, you know, we've used the search engine. We like track number 793. <laughs> uh, we need it for this thing. They, 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 so what they do instead is they work out an annual all-you-can-eat uh, buffet uh, pay-once license. And then they just go to town. And they it, it, it generates a lot of, of uh, loyalty, which is great. Well, that's how I was. The first thing I thought of is on that kind of continuity <clears throat> biz. That's continuity because I'm sure they don't. They're not going to say, "Well, we're not renewing our license this year." It's just you're the guy that provides this music, and they do renew it every year. I would say yeah, probably ninety well, percent. It's it's the reason um, it's the reason that the big licensing companies do so well versus small independent ones. Um, you know, if you're going to pay a one time fee. You want the largest possible yeah. uh, selection of, of material. So um, companies like Universal, uh, APM, who's actually a subsidiary of Universal and EMI, right. EMI themselves, BMG, uh, Sony, these massive companies own um, uh, the vast majority of the licensing world goes to this handful of companies in the trailer world there's a handful of boutique companies but that's a boutique world where they they want to, to have their hands held and they don't do these kinds of blanket licenses um ad agencies tend not to do these blanket licenses because whereas a company like espn may need to do tens or hundreds of thousands of music placements a year an advertising agency may have a couple of hundred sure that makes and sense. and that's very manageable uh, a couple of business questions come to mind on this. <clears throat> so the first one is, if if someone is trying to start a music library, because now that I'm in this world, I, I see, mm -hmm. oh, we've got a music library. It would seem to me that your best shot at becoming successful is having a very specific niche. Because a generalist, how are they going to step in and compete with guys like you, APM, you know, all these companies you just mentioned, it's like... <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Um, and the answer is 100% yes. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's it's not a great time to start a library. Yeah. Um, the competition is insane. Yeah. I mean, off the hook, debilitating to even think about insane. Yeah. There are... And, you know, these big companies are adding thousands of tracks every month. Right. Thousands or tens of thousands of new tracks show up uh, in, in these search engines, and it's all search engine based um, every month. It's, it's, I don't even know how music uh, supervisors and editors can keep up with the uh, deluge of, of content, which used to be quite mediocre, but now it's actually quite good. But what these these companies, the, the Universals and APMs, for the most part, Universal creates their own music, but uh, and so does EMI. But other companies like APM, they're distributors, right. they're publishers. They rely on third-party catalogs. And you're 100% right. They won't, the only catalogs that 
get any traction anymore are ones that's that have a very focused uh, niche of of music. So, for example, I don't know why, but right now there's a big interest in retro six, 50s, 60s, and 70s Italian music. You know, that's interesting. What a early niche, Marconi, man. you know, Nina yeah. Rota, the kind of this kitschy, you know, curb yeah. enthusiasm style of music. And there are people who scour. People who have flown to Italy to scour old recording studios, record shops, uh, any archive of music they can get their hands on, going to defunct record labels and mining it like it's gold. And That's if they crazy, can't, man. then they find uh, Italian composers. And there are several new catalogs that have just come up in the last couple of years that are kind of focused on that. There are other, uh, so so Italian, uh, you know, retro Italian music, but retro music in general is a fairly substantial um, market because it's very hard to reproduce. Um, and you know what's interesting is that you take a, a company like EMI, who's been around for the better part of a hundred years, and they've been licensing that master recording since the '40s or '50s, hmm. and. Um, <clears throat> APM, who's been around since the 60s or 70s, and the amount of music in those catalogs that ends up in uh, as samples in hip hop is fairly profound. Uh, when they want those kind of cool retro R and B horn blasts, right? right. They don't want to. They don't want to go to Verve and or Sal Soul Records and have to spend a ton of money on on licensing a master. They go to music libraries where the, the publishing and the master are owned by the same party, which is kind of the definition of a library, one-stop shopping, and um, they get it there. So there's a f phenomenal amount of sampling that starts in, in, in the library world. But, but yes, um, libraries that want to find a place in today's you know, hyper-competitive market need to come with a perspective, whatever it is. It could be music for advertising. It could be rock. It could right. be jazz, although I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, right. Um, and, and there are people who have tried it, you know, maybe world music, maybe African music, maybe Asian or South American music, maybe uh, it does it almost, it matters less than to say our library is for sports. We're a sports library. The name of our library is Sports Music Incorporated, right. and and you know, it's it's um, painting with a white with a roller and not a you know not a, yeah. not a pen a pen. It's it's to really stand for something, and that does make a big difference. Now my library is twelve years old, right? And we started off only doing trailers. That's all we did, and within a year or two, we found that. We were getting our music licensed all over the place, but not in trailers. In fact, our biggest client was sports. So then we thought, well, why don't we start doing some music that's kind of geared towards sports? Then we started getting our music licensed in commercials, and we thought, well, let's fill that out. And then we started getting our music into all kinds of reality shows, and we realized, well, that's a pretty uh, broad musical uh, palette that, that could happen because there's, you know, oh my God, will I win? Here's my sad story. Here's my happy story. Oh my God, the winner is, is, is not you, yeah. is you. <laughs> so, so we created these albums very much geared. Here's, I, I think the secret sauce for Liquid Cinema is that we don't write, produce, or, or, uh, release a single track that we don't have a feeling of who the audience is. So we. Okay, so you're very the, deliberate in what you're doing. We yes, we start with the end what we think the end use is, and then we work our way backward. But we, that's the smartest we, marketing. You know, we that, listen to other people's music. You know, we listen to we watch TV, we watch trailers, we sit and we talk about it. We get a sense of wow, there really is this kind of trend towards you know dubstep. Uh, or trap. Trap has been a big thing in sports. Atlanta um, hip hop. The, the, that's what you're talking about. The last about, few right? years. Well, du uh, 
Uh, trap isn't trap, trap Atlanta hit basically Atlanta hip hop. You, you might find it there. Trap is a big thing in the UK. Okay. Sometimes I call it drill. Okay. And and there's quite a few subgenres, but it's basically kind of halftime uh, hip hop, and um, and it, it 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 what's really good about trap is that it sits under dialogue really well. You can and by the way, we're very meticulous about how well our music works under dialogue. Uh, we 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 actually, as we're finishing up tracks, we will put on the news <clears throat> anything to have a voice, and then listen to the track. And if we get distracted, we fix it. See these little nuances. That thing you just said—that's what separates people that are doing the quality of music that's good and excellent. And well, there's you a used million, the right word. Yeah, there's a million you, you extra said steps there. Yeah, there can be. Uh, so, didn't mean to step on you there, but no, you no. said intent, and mm. and yeah, music for media in general begins with intent. What's the feeling I'm trying to create? What's the emotion I'm trying to create? Who's the audience for for this? Am I working? Am I writing for animation and a young audience? Am I writing for sitcom lovers? Am I writing for travelogues? Am I writing for you know a show for an older audience and maybe I don't want to get too electronic? What whatever it is, it starts with with um, that. In the last couple of years, we've um, started uh, releasing a lot more um, vocals songs. Oh, you have songs with and lyrics. songs and and hip hop with lyrics. So, although there's instrumental versions of everything we do, um, there's been a, a a new interest in in um, songs with an indie flavor, songs that feel like they're from albums. So, songs that don't fit the mold of of library music, which some people will will sort of put it down by saying, well, it's just generic music, um, which it was, it, it, it was at one time. I, I don't think it is anymore. I don't think it has been for a very long time. Um, you know, as the competition has gotten more fierce, the quality has had to go up. Hmm. Uh, one way you can distinguish yourself is by writing good music. Yeah, that's why I had Adam on the show and uh that was the number one thing he said you know as far as how do you differentiate yourself if you're a composer looking to get your tracks placing because you got to write really good music man yeah <clears throat> yeah, yeah i'm sorry adam taylor not uh, adam waitman oh yeah. oh adam taylor yeah yeah well he's the guy who hooked us up i think right that is correct yeah um a couple of more questions. Do you guys license only your own? Do you compose all your own music, or do you license other people's music? I'm a. Fr I don't. I'm a, <laughs> that's a. I don't want to. Like people are going to send you hundreds of tracks, but I'm just curious if. if or do you accept tracks from people, and what's the process if you do? Um. So. We have we we have probably worked, over the years with over 300 composers, but. We work with a kind of core team, um, all freelance, all people who write for us when they have time. Um, but we probably work with less than 40, less than 30 uh, producers and writers on a regular basis. We do get submissions um, and we listen to them occasionally. We don't spend a lot of time people uh, our website has a submissions page and people uh, will send links to SoundCloud or other or websites and um, you know we check it out I think in 12 years maybe we've found three or four people gotcha. in all that time yeah so but but I'll tell you something if I hear a piece of music I really like I will hunt down that composer or that or that producer and I will absolutely try to get them to, to write for us. Right. Um, the way it works is, on the business side, is it's uh, a work for hire. Um, so we take ownership of the track um, in perpetuity, you know, globally. Hmm. Um, we administer the master. Uh, we administer the publishing. The composer 
gets a percentage of any and all sync fees. Okay. And they keep 100% of the writer's share, their ASCAP, BMI, their, their PRO Great. money. Yeah. We don't even touch that. That even, even companies like ESPN are still required to fill out a form of all the music they've used. And then that gets cross-referenced to the creators of that music. And those creators end up on cue sheets uh, that get submitted to PROs just like a very traditional film or TV show. Uh, would would do, so so we we form a kind of a partnership with our writers, um, but we don't license a writer. We don't hire writers. We we license tracks. Gotcha. Um, so um, that's that's a pretty traditional business model. What we don't do or don't do very often is we don't buy out music. Um, a lot of libraries, Universal is a good example. They don't split royal uh, sync fees. They just pay a certain number of dollars to a composer, depending on their stature. Um, they say, we're just going to buy this track from you, or we're going to ask you to write us 10 tracks. We're going to pay you to write those 10 tracks. That's the last you're going to see of anything involving sync or mechanicals, but uh, you will still keep your writer's share. And, okay. and then, the, and then the, 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 the distributors keep the publishing. Oh, all of so, it. Yeah, but you guys are doing a pretty fair. Like, if you want to, if you want to get tracks licensed, they should look for the way you're doing your splits. Um. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think yeah, so. You know, yeah, yeah. look, we work on a on a fifty fifty basis, and that has right. been the industry standard. There's a few who offer less. Yes. For whatever reason, I've never seen one offer more. And right. then the other route is is the buyout route. Where they just give you some money up front, and then the, that's the end of the conversation. Do you have like how do you get how do you promote Liquid Cinema, or do you not at this point? Because oh, we it's, do we do we do aggressively. Okay, um, and it's challenging because we are what would be called a B two B company, business to business. Correct. Um, we're not interested in fans. We're not interested in. Facebook friends. We're not interested in, you know, in <laughs> You don't followers. get paid for Facebook friends? <laughs> um, <laughs> People seem to well, think they get paid for Facebook friends. It's kind of weird. Yeah. No, we don't really... <laughs> I, I don't care, care about that. Um, I mean, we do have a marketing person here at the yeah. Cinema. And, um, and what she does is we, we produce... Uh, we do produce... Um, social media content, but we have worked very hard to try to get music supervisors, music editors, producers, jingle companies, um, or you know, uh, commercial companies, trailer houses to there. There are followers. We also do uh, we do little video promos that we produce in house. Um, we do some. We used to do interviews with our artists. We don't really do that much anymore. Doesn't seem to really uh, help that much. Um, we do a we do a quarterly newsletter that goes out to all of our distributors because we're a global company. We're all over right. the world, uh, mostly working with Universal, but we have partners in other partners in other parts of the, certain parts of the world. Uh, APM is strictly a co only exists in North America. They only represent us in the U.S. and Canada because that's the only place that they are. Um, so we put out newsletters that go first of all to the in-house sales and marketing uh, teams at our distributors because, frankly, they're so bombarded with so much music uh, and new releases, we want to stand out a little bit. Yeah, so we top do of these consciousness. New yeah, man. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. You know, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. So our newsletter, we feature three or four new releases. Um, we have links to videos. We track how many people open our emails. We track how many people click on our links. We track how many people watch our, our content. So, we, you know, we're, it's, it's very, very um, targeted. Um, we, there are some uh, awards given to li music licensing companies. We've won a bunch of them, and that's another f subtle form of marketing as we... Absolutely. We, we apply for the for some of these awards. 
and um, and so uh, that that to us is is marketing. It's trying to get specifically in front of the eyeballs of editors, you know, music editors, picture editors, music supervisors, um, account executives, sales teams, marketing teams, etc. When you last question on this, and we'll move on to the next question. But um, yeah, sure. most musicians, I've been. My business is marketing for the last twenty-two years, and it saddens me because most musicians I speak to are allergic to marketing. Mm-hmm. How did you get comfortable? And and a pre and and like, hey, I know I need to market this business. It's not going to grow. It's not like a flower. You can't plant it and like just wait. You know, how did you get comfortable with that? Or, like, or are you someone that naturally had a business affinity from early on? I don't know about that. Um, a business affinity. I'm a flute player. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like some there there is the odd musician here and there that's like you know they're. You know, they grew up in a in a business environment somehow, or they were comfortable with marketing. You know, I I I think that I um, what what I do enjoy is I enjoy sharing what I do. Right now, music, of course, is is a is an act of of sharing. Just just writing music and producing it and putting it out into the world that's a form of sharing. But if people don't know about it, they're not going to they're not going to find it, they're not going to hear it. So I guess partially I'm so rather proud of everything that my team has done that I want other people to know about it. I'm I'm fiercely proud of it. I think some of it stands up uh, favorably to music you hear on top radio uh, curated playlists, Pitchfork, Radar, Music Radar, Spin, all of that. Sure. And and so, yeah, I'm always keen to see uh, people to hear the music because I want it to give them pleasure, to give them inspiration, to make them feel something. Yeah. You know, music is designed to make people feel things. Absolutely. And that's that that is there's no difference whether it's a library or a record label uh, or a concert, whatever it is, the ultimate goal is to sh- create experiences. Yeah. And what we, what, what Liquid Cinema does, what, what I do, is we cre- you know, create emotions. We create experiences at the emotional level. Uh, whether people are using it to you know, sell headache you know, tablets or uh, talk about some sports legend kind of isn't even that interesting or or relevant to me. Um, I'm always thrilled when we get our, we get our licensing statements every quarter and we go through them. We go, Oh, wow. We got used in this Pixar trailer. How cool is that? Oh, you know, um, this, this sports show that everybody watched, look, you know, about Tom Brady. Look at that! They they used our our stuff. So, I, I that that excitement has never changed from day one to now, twelve years right. later. I'm always thrilled that people like our music enough to put it into their um, projects. So, from a marketing perspective, <clears throat> it's just about the desire for people to um, know about us understand what we do, learn to maybe trust us, maybe understand a little bit about us. Hmm. Um, but ultimately, it's just, you know, you know, when you go to an ice cream store and they have the little spoons and you can get the little samples. Right. And then you pick the ice cream you really like and you get a bucket of it. That's, <laughs> that's, that's marketing. Right, right, 100%. And it's interesting you use the word sharing because in, in our course, the Music Licensing Profits Program, John talks about th- that's the mindset you need to have. You can't be afraid of this stuff. You've got to share your music. And if you don't, you're not going to, no one's going to listen to it. That's just the bottom line, period. No one care who you are. So it's yeah. A good word. Um, you know, even companies like Coke will say, okay, we're the number one soft drink brand in the world. 
just flat out. But if we stopped advertising, we would plummet and vanish almost immediately. Absolutely. Everybody knows Coke. Everybody who knows it, who drinks cola, loves it. It is, you know, it's that ubiquitous thing of, of you don't ask for a cola. Right. Um, but <laughs> but 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 the people at Coca Cola know that if they ever ever sit on their laurels of being the most popular, the most well known brand of 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 um, beverage in the world, they're gone. Pepsi yeah. will immediately, you know, come up and and take over, and that is true of every company, no matter how big or small. Um, Everything comes from repeated, regular, um, and savvy uh, marketing. Yeah, I agree. And with you music is, and music artists are the same. Totally. You know, you can be Ed Sheeran or Harry Styles. You know, one of the biggest pop stars in the world. But if your label doesn't get out and and promote and make the videos and hustle the the journalists and get the licenses and get the guest appearances and book you on shows you just disappear somebody a week younger and you know one percent better looking is is you know has a great track and everybody wants to hear it so yeah. it never marketing never stops i think it's well spoken well said thank you i agree with you too <clears throat> uh just curious if do you have a favorite media that you enjoy scoring to most or least because you mentioned you know movies television <clears throat> shows documentary video games foreign films advertising you know reality I have done shows. all those things it is I true know. Um, what, uh, yeah, is there a favorite know, the short the short answer is the medium itself doesn't really matter okay uh, I've worked on movies I mean I love movies you know I grew up on movies uh, I've worked on movies that were enormously pleasurable, and I've worked on movies that really, truly sucked the life out of me and gave me no pleasure. Um, and, and I didn't I didn't grow up playing video games. Um, I didn't get into any of that until really recently, but I've become very I've been getting a lot of video game work. Right. And you know what? It's exactly the same. I've worked on some games that were incredibly uh, enjoyable experiences, even if I ne didn't ever play that game. And I've worked on games in, that suck the life out of me. So ultimately, what I am drawn to is working with people who get me, who uh, respect the process of creativity, hmm. that sometimes it takes a few tries, or... Sometimes you have to try, put it up to picture to see if it works and then be willing to say, yeah, or, well, you know, let's try something. Maybe it's too fast. Maybe it's too busy, whatever. And um, and that's that's the joy for me is is in the people and the relationships that I, I, I do, you know, on a personal level. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a movie junkie. Um, TV to a slightly lesser extent. I don't play. I'm not a gamer. Uh, I'm a very casual video game player, but it's important for me to kind of understand the relationship of music and play because it's very different than the more passive experience of music while watching. Yeah, it is because it's a very you're engaged, and so you got your brain is out. much busier when you're playing a game than when you're yeah. watching. Even even a twisty Christopher Nolan movie, you know, when you're trying to figure out what the fuck just happened, um, <laughs> it's totally. it's still a very different experience. So, I, I think that's a very unsatisfying answer. That um, no, no, he said you like good <clears throat> stuff. It doesn't really matter the 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 type of oh, it's your not about the quality of the yeah. of the material. I mean, I will say this: it's almost impossible, if not absolutely impossible to write good music for a bad project yeah you had, you had if the material that, so. sucks it just doesn't matter what you what you what you do it it's uh 
it, it, it wouldn't matter. You can't unsuck a, a, a project, unfortunately. You know, I mean, every so often you'll hear people say, well, the movie was so-so, but God, the score was gorgeous. Um, you almost never hear somebody say, um, well, you know, there are some good movies with mediocre scores, but it's quite rare. Quite yeah. rare. There's yeah. lots of bad movies with good music. But they're still bad movies. Nobody's ever said, you know, I would have hated that movie, but thank God there was really good yeah. music. So <laughs> I had, you know, I had such a good time. Score, <laughs> you know, yeah. anybody who thinks that a score can save a project, whether, no matter what it is, is um, it's wishful thinking at best. Do you remember that old movie called Soylent Green with Charlton Heston? Soylent Green. It's people. People, yeah. You know what? Uh, I watched that the other, like about a week ago. No, probably about three or four weeks ago. And because I'm in this world now, I'm very attentive to scores. And the, mm -hmm. the score where they, you know, where Saul goes into this chamber to die, basically, voluntary terminating his life because, you know, the world sucks. And they have all these flowers and the deer. And it was just so interesting. You know, it was kind of a classical motif, and it was just interesting how all that stuff works, man. And um, um, it's very engaging. I, I don't remember the music from that film. Do you remember who wrote it? That's not a Jerry Goldsmith score, is it? I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. I did look at the end of the movie, but between now and a month ago, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky I remember what happened yesterday, Jeff. To be honest, I, with you. I I know that feeling very well. <laughs> But uh, it was just interesting how things move and how important it is. You know, I, I recognize the importance of score. It has to be, you know, connecting but seamless. You know? Yep. Silent Green. I'm actually just yeah, you know, me all that? curious now. You know, uh, Fred Myro. So Fred Myro was an L.A. avant-garde composer. Um, I think he taught uh, composition at USC. Uh, had a very, very small uh, uh, film uh, career. But, but uh, yeah, he's sort of a known quantity in a very, 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 uh, very small circle. <laughs> That's interesting, man. It's amazing you know this. Uh, I wanna well, hey, it's kind of... It's kind of what I do. <laughs> well, I know, but it's a tiny little, you, you know, it's a, that guy is, and this is 50 years ago, too. 73, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I heard you say something in an interview that really resonated with me. You said, who of us is qualified to do anything? From time to time, you just have to get thrown into the fire. And I want to hear you talk about this because... One of the things I always, when I'm in, like, cons when people hire me for consulting on marketing stuff, and a lot of times they say, well, I don't feel I'm qualified to do this. And I always say, man, if you're waiting for the expert fairy to come through the door, you know, and wave their wand and saying, you're an expert, <laughs> you're never going to get off the ground. So I'd love to hear you talk about that. Who of us is qualified to do anything? The, um, hmm. Well... You know, let's let's change one word in that sentence. Mm -hmm. Let's replace the word qualified with the word ready. Ready. Fair enough. Who's ever ready? You know, I mean, yeah, you, you, you probably, you know, had to take driving lessons before you were allowed uh, behind the wheel of a car uh, with or without other other uh, people in, in involved. But as artists or anything subjective. I think if you're a lawyer, if you're a surgeon, a doctor, uh, an accountant, there's certain uh, needed, required knowledge. You know, I need to right. know anatomy. I need to know tax codes, whatever it mm -hmm. is. Sure. And then what you don't know, you can learn on the job, you know. Um, you know, there's a reason that lawyers, you know, you see them in, in pictures, there's always a bookcase just filled with those, you know, sure. dark, dark red leather bound books, um, because you're always learning. So I accept, I, I, I think it's understood that they call it practicing medicine for a reason. Sure. So it's, it's a frightening reason, but there's a scary, reason for it. I know. Um, but you know, as an artist, 
or anything related to the arts, whether it's arts management, like a record company or a publishing company, um, any of those things, but especially if you're actually an art, trying to be an artist, you know, are you what do what are what are the qualifications of of being an artist? Well, there are none. Correct. There are none. Um, are you? Is anybody ready to be an artist? You know, was Picasso ready to be Picasso? Well, actually, his first stuff was fairly generic, and then one day he kind of dropped it and, and changed. And, you know, a lot of great artists have to generate a little bit of bad art. Um, it, it's quite rare that your very first attempt of, of anything, you know, amounts to anything. If you've seen interviews or articles with, well, Alanis Morissette, you know, she put out quite a few albums where she was really being very derivative of other singers that she admired. And Katy Perry, much later, did exactly the same thing. She had several flops because she was trying to sound like Alanis Morissette. Um, but then eventually they quit trying to just be. And maybe that's the definition of, of, of ready or qualified is when you feel that you're ready to be to be yourself. Um, I will say that there is an aesthetic side to art, but there is, just to stick with music, since I'm not really qualified to talk about anything else, there's also a, there's a, another layer to it, which is, and we deal with this at Liquid Cinema all the time, which is, okay, you're a good writer, but are you a great producer? Right. Because... It has to sound great. The quality of the recording has to be amazing. And this is where a lot of people fall down. But but there's an easy fix. You either A, learn, or B, you find somebody to do yeah, it for you. Right. Um, you know, I, I've, all, I've always believed that one of the paths to success is to surround yourself with people who are better at what they do than you are at what you do. Yeah, so I write, you know, I've I've learned to write music. I wasn't very good at it when I started. I got some opportunities early on to learn by being a ghostwriter. That was invaluable to me. On the side, again, putting out just a shit, 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 shit music. But <laughs> with each one, I had people saying, you know, Jeff, that really sucked. But if you did this, it might be a lot better. And Roughly a hundred percent of the time, they were right. <laughs> Roughly a hundred percent, and I was willing. I was willing to listen. Yeah. So when my opportunities came to do my own scoring work, t TV, film, uh, and games, um, I you know I don't have there, there. There's no such thing as a diploma, if you will, at, in, in art. Um, yeah. I mean, you might go to a university or college, and, you know, if you have a degree, well, that's great. But what's your degree in? Well, it's more in the mechanics. Correct. You know, uh, you know knowing how to write music on paper doesn't give you the ability to write a symphony. Um, you know, owning, owning a, a, a sequencer doesn't give you the ability to come up with a theme. Uh, and being able to have, so, uh, you know, music is something you can't learn, something you can't teach. But you can you can learn and be taught the mechanics of a good arrangement. You can be taught simplicity. You can be taught sound quality. You can be taught uh, perspective and mixing. And frankly, you could probably do just as well on YouTube than you can do from NYU. Right. Um, when it comes when it comes to these things. There's an enormous amount of good information. Sadly, there's also people who are just dead wrong, um, but who, you know, lack the self-awareness to keep their mouths shut. <laughs> but, there's an, but there's an amazing amount of knowledge. What is that of expression? Knowledge. Seldom right, but never in doubt. <laughs> Someone said uh, that well, years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> e e exactly. So, you know, the, the, when, are, when are we ever ready? Uh, I'm still waiting. I am not. I am still waiting to be to be ready. Yeah. Um, somebody once asked. I love this. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Aaron Copeland. Mm -hmm. And in in an interview, somebody once asked him if he waited for inspi inspiration before he started writing. 
And he said, yeah, I wait for inspiration every day. Yeah, right on. So, you know, um, it's this, this, there's parts of this that are very difficult to talk about. I mean, is confidence always a good thing? Yes, unless it blinds you from listening, A, to advice, B, to good advice, yeah. but also listening to your own music. Um, I don't know if we talked about this last time, but my, there's, to me, there is one distinguishing factor between a, a good composer and a not good composer. And the only difference I've ever known is that a good composer knows when they've written crap. Yeah. And they throw it away. They don't try to polish it. They throw it away and go, you know what? Blind, blind alley. Whereas other, lesser, lesser composers, f whatever that means, you know, may, their output is far more unpredictable, uneven. Uh, the quality is up and down. The, the thing about a really good artist is that they tend to be you may not like everything they do. You may say, wow, I, I really like their scores, but that one score, I didn't like that score. But I'll guarantee you the quality of that uh, from a technical level, from the production level, from the arranging level, the, the intent, like we were talking about before, yeah. will be exactly the same. Will be exactly the same. You know, every score you've ever heard, game, TV, movie, was written under terrible conditions limited budget for the most part limited time 100% of the time often with communication issues between the the composer and producers and directors and yet look at all the amazing music that's come from these these collaborations yeah but um, you know should a brand I mean maybe the question is is you're right out of college you just you know you just went to Berkeley or, or you just went to school to study music and you studied film music or you studied music production or you studied pop or you studied something for which there is a, a marketplace in this world of ours. Now, should you come out with all the swagger and bravado and go, man, I, I'm, I am the next hot thing. Take my word for it. Hire me. Or, or what do you do? You know, so being ready and being confident are two very different things. Yeah. Can you can you be an artist without confidence? No. Uh, creativity is a is an act of bravery. Hundred percent of the time, the fact that you're willing to write, you know, or create something, and allow it to be heard by other people on the planet, that's brave. Um, does everybody deserve it? Um, not always. But um, I feel most people, if they, if they learn to hone their craft, learn to, learn to hear. Because I've never really met anybody who went to a school where they taught you to listen to your own music and with a critical, uh, with a critical eye. And, and that's a problem, you know. Uh, even as an instrumentalist, it was many, many years of study before I had one very insightful teacher who, who just stopped me and said, are you listening to what you're doing? Wow. And I was that's thinking, cool. well, no, I, this is where my fingers go and uh, my breath control and my embouchure and my tongue placement and, and, you know, you know, the alternate fingerings and, you know, and I thought, no, I'm so busy doing that I wasn't listening. And he said, I'm going to stop you. You can't be a, an instrumentalist if you don't listen to yourself play and ask yourself, am I, am I creating the experience that I'm trying to create? You know? And with, with that one statement one day when I was still a teenager or in my early 20s, it changed everything. Uh, and I mean, I didn't, I didn't stick with being an instrumentalist, thank God. But um, this idea of of not being distracted by the process of creation enough to to listen, 
But I have to add one caveat, and I don't think I'm answering your question, but uh, I'll finish this, this thought. And it has to do with self-criticism. And, and for me, it's been a very important thing. Um, to be critical of one's work is vital. But to be self-critical causes a problem, and here's why. To me, the act of creating is actually down under all the, the layers of, of making art is a series of thousands upon thousands of rapid decisions. What's next? What's next? Is that working? Should I go up? Should I go down? You know, should I go to a, a chord I'm expecting? Should I go to a chord I'm not expecting? Should I modulate? Should I bring in the trumpets here? Should I, should I bring in, uh, you know, a new beat here? Ultimately, creating means making decisions. And I personally believe you need to make them as fast as you possibly can. And what will stop you from that is if you stop and question every decision. So... You know, I think I'm going to modulate to A flat. You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe A flat's not the right way to go. Maybe I should go to the subdominant. Maybe I should go to a D. Oh, no, D flat. You know, I started in F, and I don't want to end up in that weird, you know, third. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's it's you know the 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 centipede thinking about it's it's you know walking. And so I I'm a believer that you create as intuitively as you can, as quickly as you can, then you stop. Maybe it's two bars, maybe it's three notes, maybe it's 16 bars, and you go and you hit play on your sequencer, or you go back to your sheet music, whatever, and you go, you know what, that wasn't bad, but you know what, I think, I think it could be better. Um, so I guess the idea is you, you can't create and criticize simultaneously. Yeah. The act of creation is the act of having that, that confidence, feeling ready. Whether you are or not, that act of creating is feeling ready. And I think that's kind of the beauty and the mystery of, of making art, is that it comes from who knows where, who knows how, but once you've brought it, you've birthed it, then you can start to clothe it a little bit and ask yourself, could I have done this better? You know, let me save it and try it again. You know, do alternates. You know, um, when I'm working on a theme, I hit go on my sequencer to a click or a drum beat and I'll play something and then I'll just stop, wait two bars, do it again, stop, wait two bars. Oh, now I've gotten something. No, now I've got another section of it. Stop. Eventually, I'll go, wait a minute, maybe I have something. I'll edit it, put it in place, and then I'll work on the next and the next and the next. But it's this, um, it's the back and forth of creating, criticizing, creating, criticizing, but never, ever trying to do both at the same time. So I think part of being qualified or ready to be an artist is to embrace failure to embrace the bravery of trying to make something and then finding out what works for you and you alone that allows you to be unfettered, unchained, uh, and be free, but then to go back and go, well, I think I could do better. This will be better once I orchestrate it in a different way. Or maybe if you're working to uh, if you're working on a movie to go, you know, this is a great little tune, but it does doesn't fit this character anymore. It doesn't fit the scene. Doesn't have enough of this, or it has too much of that. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to just put this in a box, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to start over because I have to get the, the 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 emotion of this particular moment just right. Man, that was awesome. That was really valuable for anybody who's looking to create. Thank you. You know, I don't know if I'm answering anything for anybody, but, um, I, I, you know, look, I, I, because I was a ghostwriter, that, th those were my training wheels. Yeah. I mean, they're very high-level training wheels, but they were training wheels for sure. Not everybody needs to do that. 
Uh, and there are people who can sit down and score a scene and be quite brilliant at it. There are some people who do have an aptitude musically or artistically. Um, I don't think I'm one of those people. I think I had to do it through practice and and uh, repetition and having a lot of really great composers listen to my music and say, that's crap, and, and help me learn to listen to my own music. And over time, I got better, but very gradually. Thank you. Three more questions. Uh, do you have any hobbies outside of music? Uh, I paint. I do, I do, do a bit really? of visual art. That's cool. What kind of painting? Uh, like oil painting or? No, acrylic spray paint. <laughs> um, Are you like stenciling, tagging stenciling? shit all over L.A. or something? Uh, yeah. I've tagged that, the back room a little bit. What's uh, your graffiti name? By accident. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it doesn't work that way, pal. <laughs> I'm going to go back to New York and look at the trains and find it. <laughs> no, so I'm painting? not one of those guys. I'm not one of those what, guys. What else? Anything else? Um, you know, uh, for some reason, I decided to take on uh, directing a, a short film. Uh, cool. A cu couple years ago, I made a short documentary about a um an introspective edm artist what's it called is it on youtube it is on youtube uh what's the name of the movie is um cold blue a portrait cold blue dash a portrait um it's on my youtube page but it's also on the artist's uh, record label really love the film and they they had a youtube channel for videos and so Black Hole Records, I think, is it. But if you just type that, only one thing comes up. And it's a 15-minute That's uh, cool, man. film. Just that kind of looks at something you wouldn't expect because DJs tend to have this swagger and bravado. And um, here's a guy who likes to sit in the woods and just listen to uh, silence. And, and I really enjoyed that, um, that unexpected dichotomy. So I learned... Uh, I, I grew up... At, as, as uh, I was interested in being a photographer. I had a, a, a family member who was a very, very successful commercial photographer and taught me photography very well. And actually in college, I was an art major, not a music major at first. So making the transition from photography to cinematography wasn't that difficult. So I, I invested in a decent 4K camera and a lighting rig and a few other pieces of kit and audio. And then I taught myself uh, picture editing because... You know, when you've worked a lot in film and I have dear friends who are picture editors and you kind of, some of it rubs off, although editing is incredibly, incredibly difficult. Oh, it's horrible, man. Yeah. Trying to create pace and and sustain uh, an emotion in a story or a documentary. It's, I, you, you have to really respect editors. They They are storytellers at the highest level and they do it in a purely technical way. What's the next movie? Are you doing another one? I started one about a jazz musician here in L.A. I don't know. He's not in good health. It may or may not get finished, but um, he was, he's probably, he's a studio musician as well as a jazz musician. Probably the most, one of the most recorded musicians in history. And yet wow. the, the way the world has shifted with technology, his, his, function is sort of over yeah I, I really wanted to capture that arc so I, I every so often i get together with him and we shoot a little bit so i have quite a lot of material but I, there's a core that's still missing and i'm waiting for him to regain his his health that's awesome man well good luck with that and please let me know if it comes out yeah also i write books i've written a couple right. of, of books and i just i i'm literally uh, looking at the final um, proofs of this new book. Well, the third edition of the main book that I've written called The Real World, R-E-E-L. It's about and scoring? It's a and it's a book about scoring uh, film, television, uh, and video games. And it's, um, it's in three sections. One is on the aesthetics, one's on the technology, and one's on the business and career. Dude, when do you sleep? Um, when I need to. 
<laughs> that was a very good answer. <laughs> uh, tell me, Jeff, what was, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And how much of that change has been intentional and how much has just been a natural part of aging? Um, you know, that's a good question. Any cha- I don't think I've had any sort of sea changes, you know, just sudden changes. But, you know, look, I've had to do a lot of work over the years to understand myself and to understand why certain things have had the effect on me that they have. And, um, you know, look, I think with every every positive and negative experience, there's there's a, if you go about life in a certain way, there's a lesson to be learned in in everything. I've always felt that every every encounter I have, positive or negative, is a is a learning experience. I think I look at life as a learning experience. And I think over the last, you know, few years, you know, now that you're speaking to a man of a certain age. Of a certain age. Um, <laughs> you know, now that I'm, uh, you know, not a young guy anymore, um, I think I am, I have gained more tolerance uh i don't know you know i don't know if i'm patient in some ways i feel like i'm less patient now i think what's changed okay i think i have become highly allergic to anything that wastes time oh dude you should be <laughs> because because wasting my time is wasting my life and and uh you know not that my demise is imminent that i know of Although, you know, I've certainly had friends um, check out unexpectedly and and without any any warning. And not that I'm fatalistic about it. I don't think I am. Um, I think the main thing is to be that I've tr- I try to live my life to be uh, efficient makes it sound, you know, like, I'm, you know, uh, you know, putting You're a well oiled like, machine on, on, on file, <laughs> you know, on three by five cards. Um it's not that I'm organized, uh, but I think I just focus on what is important to me and try to minimize what isn't. Man, I'm with you. Uh, about 20 years ago, my wife wrote, I was on the phone one day and she was sitting there waiting for me. So she randomly started writing and it was like a top 10 things that bother Craig. And the first one was like waste his time. And like every other one was some version of waste his time. <laughs> so yeah, I'm the sure. same way, man. It's like you can make money. You can't make time. So like, there's your, you, well, then you've found your core, your core yeah. value. You can't waste time, man. You got to like. <laughs> You know, relaxing is cool. That's not wasting time, but you can't waste time. You know, I agree with you, man. I'm totally with you on that. And last question, uh, and thank you the for last everything. Question. The last Craig, question. Craig, uh, you know, again, thank you for what you're doing. You know. Um, Thanks, man. It's uh, it's highly appreciated. Thank you. Now, now, that, I'm li- now that I'm a listener. <laughs> Thanks, man. First time caller. <laughs> <laughs> Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> that doesn't reveal our age. Uh, <laughs> most fun thing you've ever done? Um, most fun thing I've ever done. Yeah. Um, wow, I shouldn't have to struggle with that. I know it's not um, an easy question. It's a new question. I've only just started asking this one. What's the most fun? Um, learning to surf badly. Really? You, you enjoyed surfing that much? <laughs> no, I didn't. Oh. I, but but I, enjoy, I enjoyed the process of getting out there. I mean, I grew up in the ocean. I grew up here in L.A., so the ocean means a lot. And then I kind of moved away from it a little bit. And then getting back into it was... You know, an incredibly joyful uh, experience. Um, probably a, a couple of a couple of travel experiences that were unusually and profoundly joyful. Um, a trip to Bali where I got to drive around wow. in a 1973 VW van oh, with dude, a local so cool. who took me, and I, I took I brought a a field recorder with me, and I recorded. All the music of Bali, including from these little tiny villages where nobody goes. And by the way, it's on my. I was going to say no, that's a pretty. Niche. I put it out. It's yeah, out. Good. It's out. Good. You can get it on my Spotify or Apple <laughs> Music. 
<laughs> it's just called Exploring Bali. But I got to say, man, the, the recording is interesting, <laughs> but the experience was so fun. That's cool. Just man. an incredible experience. You know? And, That's nice, uh, man. Anyway. Exploring Bali. All right. Let me uh, thank you for everything. Let me tell people where they could find you and all your stuff. First of all, Liquid Cinema. If you are interested in licensing music, please go to Liquid Cinema. Check out their catalog. There's a contact tab there, and please reach out to them. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have a lot to choose from there. Uh, Co I can't read my writing. Cold Blue, a portrait. Please check out Jeff's short movie. Is that, it's not called, what is it? Sh not short movie. What's it called? Short movie is like this. It's, a, docu is it? it's a short documentary. Do short documentary. Please check out Cold Blue, uh, a, 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 a portrait, and it's uh, Jeff's short documentary he did. Um, Let's hit the socials, Craig. Exploring Bali. Yeah, okay. Um, Instagram, so, Jeff yeah. Rona Music, M-U-Z-I-K. Yeah. And he also Spotify and Apple Music. Yeah. Um, Jeff Please follow got, me. Please follow yeah. me on, on, on everything. Follow me on, on Spotify. Uh, follow me on Instagram. Um, I'm also on Twitter, but barely. But Instagram yeah, and, and is where I kind of stay in touch with, with people. And I even I give some musical tips and I share. Beyond, I share. beyond what you've given here, I don't even think that's possible, man, to be honest with you. You never know. Every so often. Check out Instagram, Jeff Rona Music, M E Z I K. Also, Jeff's got two solo albums. One is called Projector, the other one's called Vapor, as well as several soundtrack albums. Please check them out on all the streaming services. He's got two books and about to have a third on Amazon. Uh, so, about scoring music, obviously, and uh, he's mm. probably one of the smartest Actually, guys. Actually, can I add one more thing? Yeah, Craig? man, of course, um, please do. With, with my album Projector, it's. it's um, Available on as a signed and limited edition numbered uh, vinyl pressing, but only on my Bandcamp page. And that's bandcamp.jeffrona.com? I believe it is. Okay. Or so bandcamp.com slash jeffrona, whatever. Check that out because one day you will be, it's like investing in Bitcoin. Like you'll be able to sell it on, on eBay one day. You have no idea. We're, we're down to a handful. We're down yep. to a handful. Please check that out. And, uh, I just want to ask you one more question because I know also uh, the real world, uh, and now I don't even know what that is. I'm sorry, I wrote it down 30 seconds ago. My this is how I can't remember the real R E E L. That's your book. Yeah, that's the book. Okay, you're, the, you're the said. real world. Right, part th part one and two out. Part three is coming. Uh, one last thing. Tell me about the documentary you scored Shark Water because I know that meant a lot to you. Oh, yeah, that was um, kind of my introduction to becoming um, uh, an, eco an ecological uh, activist. Um, that, that movie is now 15 years old, and, uh, and yet it's still completely relevant, although it's a film about uh, the decimation of, of the shark population due to shark finning um, by mostly Asian yeah. uh, pirates. And... Um, and, uh, you know, it, it started a friendship with uh, a, a brilliant documentary filmmaker who passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we did several films together. But learning to take what I love to do in making music and turning it into social activism. And actually, that film ended up getting multiple countries to pass laws. And so it actually has had a, a profound effect. And That's I'm awesome. really, really grateful for that experience. Yeah, and I think that practice is gross as well, so I'm glad you did that. All right, man. Uh, thank you for everything. Hang on one second. Let me wrap up. Any final words you want to part with? Peace out. Peace out. There you go. Hang on one second. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your socials. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Jeff Rona. Please check out everything I just mentioned and support him, support Liquid Cinema and all the cool stuff he's doing. Uh, what did I write? Thanks to Tim Rona. Who the hell is that? Got God, me. I'm, a, I'm a mess here, man. <laughs> Most important, man, remember that happiness is a choice, so please choose wisely. Be nice. Enjoy. Be nice. Go play a guitar or whatever else you're playing and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Jeff, thank you very much for everything. I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much.